All right. All right, welcome everyone. Uh, here's another Bio 10 Sacred Tea Party. Today we're going to do episodes four, five, and six of uh, Bio 10 Sacred Tea Conversations, Leonid Bloom's Everything I Know series, interviewing Steve Levin on his personal history and his journey to to find and delve into bio tensegrity. Um, if you don't want to be seen on YouTube, you should have your camera off. I think everybody here knows that. But please keep your camera on until we, uh, after we do the opening toast. What we're going to do is show episodes four and five, which are about 20 something minutes long. Then we're going to take a 10 minute bio chat question break and then we'll jump into episode six these are so important the material in here all goes together and it's so important that we really didn't want to wait any longer to um, get these out to you so uh, without further ado i'm going to ask board member doug johnson to do our opening toast coffee <laughs> welcome everybody um i was just looking out in the backyard and uh, every day appreciating that it's spring and new things are coming out every day new flowers are blooming and it seems uh, appropriate to have these new three videos that even though a lot of us are very familiar with this information it's just there, there's so many possibilities and new life that that uh, it, and possibilities that that we that I every time I listen to these I hear more so uh, to spring and to these new videos. Lachayim, okay. So let's see if I can share screen and we'll jump into number four. If we can ask everyone on Zoom to. Uh turn their cameras off it helps with the uh, the process yes Dear friends, we're up to the next episode of Everything I Know with Dr. Stephen Levin. And in the previous episode, we actually really highlighted the point of the accumulated anxiety, right? So when it was coming from the dissatisfaction with the application of the standard biomechanics model and the standard calculations to the human body and to this specific imbalances in the liver system and then taken to the extent further on with the visits to the Smithsonian and then the exploration of the same principle on a larger scale when it comes to the dinosaurs who didn't leave the tail tracks in the sense of time so that was building this dissatisfaction and the anxiety what's going on how to try to figure it out and to explain I think that this is really a critical thing so that the time doesn't blend for us that we relieve it you know in the forwards motion and understand that it was the anxiety and the dissatisfaction first and the willingness to go into the tight corners into the corners which are not con you know conveniently being explained and actually face the challenge there and say well what could be a different model a different way of looking at it and again it's not just a single way just we're looking we're f facing that dissatisfaction saying well that's where the classic standard biomechanics model crumbles so steve has been looking his own way he's been on his own path which has been really shaped by his you know the entire history as we can already see and that's where the things then started taking shape and well we are 
arriving to that combination when finally the click happened. So okay. let's get it there. We're still in the Smithsonian, right? The Smithsonian. And I used to go there. I, I was working um, actually four and a half days a week and I would spend at least a half a day every week down at the Smithsonian. So that was and your kind of, weekend. that was your time off. That was my time off. That's where I was. That was my uh, uh, decompression and my nine clinical time. But so I spent a lot of time there and I did, you know, and there are a lot of sections there. So there is the dinosaur section, but there's also the uh, bones of the, of the big old uh, creatures, the uh, giant sloths and the uh, elephants and the evolution of the horse. And, mm, the, mm. and there's also a whole section on just osteology uh, where they go through the whole section and uh, they have uh, monkeys and whatever, and uh, the whole osteology section of modern... So it was already there. So oh yeah, this is all there. So that what we what we see in there, you know, displays today is very much the already the, the main fossils and all this. Yeah, it, the, the layout of the collection was there already 50 years back. Yeah, it's it's all it's already there, and it's the same. It hasn't really changed much, except they've just up, upgraded the dinosaur section, mm. which I haven't seen yet. I haven't seen the. the we well, might even go there. We will go there. Okay. But, so they just upgraded, but the rest is the same. And in fact, in the osteology section, they have two things. One, they talk about the lever system of, of the bones in the osteology. And they do have a picture of the George Washington Bridge there as a structure showing that there must be some tension compression elements in the structure. They recognize it there. Mm. And that's been there for, right, for at least 50 years. So it's still there. And it's, a, it's actually it's one of the displays I would eventually hope will change. Okay. All right. So, I'm, so I spent a lot of time there. Some alone, some with uh, with Nicholas Hatton. Uh, but I, I, I spent a lot of time. Just just a clarification. But when was the time? When when was? This do you remember when you first met Nicholas Hatton? It was in the winter of '75. Oh, so it's actually like really was the the the, the crescendo was sort of. Oh, yeah, the yeah. tempo of the it was, was probably, coming it, up. It, it would probably maybe it was a it maybe it was the fall of '74. It was mm. that during that period of time. So it's about like a half a year of really right. intense new was, relationship it, in this. Right. Sense. It was a it was a half a year of really immersed in 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 the Smithsonian and the bones and trying to understand all this problem, which was driving me crazy. And it became more intense. As so, but but. By driving you crazy, like well, how did it feel? There's an area, there's a bit of anxiety, but you know, here I am taking care of people with back pain, and you know, it, I mean, that's what I was. I, I, my practice was really getting focused into back pain, so here I am taking care of these people with back pain. So this is where you were mixing the manual and the surgical, right? Right. So I would just understand. My assumption would be some days you would be working at the office manually and, and, and some days you would right. be booking the operation uh, theater yeah. and then doing exactly. the surgeries there. Exactly. Okay. So, but, so, but, you know, here I am operating and examining patients and, and, and treating them and getting fairly good results but not really understanding uh, the mechanics of what was going on because I knew that what was out there was not right. You mean the model itself? The, 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 the model of this, uh, you know, extreme forces created by the, the levers in, this, in the body could not be an accurate model. So you, you went by feel, you went by, well, experiential, but the educational aspect of it bugged you. Right. So, right. So that I, you know, intuitively I did the right thing. I mm. did the, Except I was always a little uncomfortable with the surgery because I wasn't sure why I was doing what I was doing. Like, but it did work. Even to that extent? Yes. But it did work. But, but what were the main sort of, the, there were, were those typical surgeries or you, know, you, you followed certain procedures which you kind of adopted out of the slew or you were diverse or you figured out that there was some particular thing that you Kind of got to in prefer. those days, most of the problems were related to 
uh, uh, herniated disc, degenerative disc kind of concepts and um, and degeneration of the joints down there. And so they, you would mostly consider doing spinal fusions. So, and that's what you did actually? Yeah, essentially doing spinal fusions of L4-5, 5-1, you know, that F3, L3-4-5. Uh, I wasn't doing much in the way of scoliosis and I wasn't really comfortable in doing many of the next. It was almost all low back pain. But just to understand, but, so, but when it came to the practical implementation in your surgery, so I understand that the, the idea of the fusion means that there is a disc protrusion or the disc prolapse, so you do the, you effectively right. di dissect the thing and then fuse it together. Right. Were there any, you know, things that you felt that were strange in, the te in those techniques or w any experiments that you kind of tried and to, you know, to spare the tissue or to kind of, you know, or to change the tension and balance? Or no, you couldn't really do that. So you yeah, had to follow the... Yeah, one of the problems is, of course, if you deviate from what is accepted surgically and some trouble, something arises, okay, so you're, you're... you're in big trouble. <laughs> Okay. See, and it's one of the reasons why uh, surgeons uh, are, are, don't experiment very much. You know, somebody establishes a protocol and they do it this way if they decide to, well, maybe we ought to try it that way. Unless you're in a position where you're an experimental, uh, you know, part of a, a research team in a medical school, mm. something or other, you're in trouble. In, so because in, that would be the yeah, medical negligence right, in that sense. Right. And so, you know. Mm. It is, it's very rigid, you know, once you start doing surgery, somebody teaches you what to do and you do it and you do it that way until a new method comes along that's handed down by the higher authority. So uh, within the American Society of the uh, Orthopedic, right. um, is it Orthopedic Medicine or Orthopedic Surgery? Orthopedic Surgery. Okay. I see. So that's where you didn't have much of the wiggle room in that you respect. You don't have any wiggle room. When you're doing surgery, you better stick to prayers. Stick, stick, to to stick to what is known. Okay, stick, stick to, to protocol. protocol. Otherwise, you're in trouble, and you don't know if the patient's going to get it. But if the patient gets in trouble, you're in trouble. Hmm. If you haven't stuck to protocol. So in that sense, what you've been doing in the more sort of diverse period of your the surgical of your orthopedic career, when you were doing you know the manual resetting of the fractures and so on, there was a lot more room for kind of a personal touch there. Yes. So yeah, and, yeah. But that, that sort of shaped your perspective there, and here you were more in the yeah, protocol. Yeah, much more to it. But I was still, I was, although I was focused on spine surgery and things, I was still doing some general surgery, some knee surgery. Hmm. Um, so I had some of that in there. Because, again, as I got better on the manual medicine end of surgery, of, of back pain, I had less back pain surgery to do. Mm. So I had to fill in the surgical part. <laughs> I see, I see, okay. <laughs> okay, so you know, you were shooting yourself in the foot financially in that respect, but exactly. you still had to pay the main then the, the fees of the membership, right? You know, it's not just the membership, it's that you know, as a surgeon your insurance fees are very you know, Yeah, very high. So very for the high malpractice, yeah. For malpractice insurance. So so you have to do surgery in order just to make enough money to maintain your okay I see that's your a malpractice insurance that, so as I was cutting as I was solving back problems other than with surgery I had to keep on doing some of this other surgical things okay I see and at that time arthroscopic surgery of the knee was coming in that really wasn't very much until then. Okay, so that's so, another interesting thing so, that we're facing there. So I started, so I got involved in doing some arthroscopic surgery of the knee, and, and mm. so, so that was, that was the, really the beginning of the whole arth arth arthroscopic pretty, thing. That was very early in, in arthroscopic surgery. And uh, but was it a big breakthrough in that respect? Oh yeah, arthroscopic surgery was a real breakthrough because. Um, you could, it's most, in those days we weren't doing much surgery through the scope. And that was, uh, at first you, for our first use of the scope was just for, uh, just to see what was going on. Mm. Um, and sometimes you do it and you do a scoping to see what was going on and then do open surgery to, you know, to remove the, uh, the meniscus or something or other. Mm. Um, and then as, Techniques got more refined. We start doing uh, using instruments to do the, the uh, surgery right through the little scope things. Mm. 
right? So, but it, it, early on, when I first started doing it, it was just putting a scope in to see what was going on. So, effectively, to do the open surgery just to see what's going on. Right. So, okay, so that was really a big breakthrough yeah. in that sense. But, yeah, so in that period of time, I was just, I was just starting in the, in the at that time. Um, I kept doing some surgery uh, on so that I got, the, it, the arthroscopic part became more important and actually helped in understanding what I was doing. Hmm. So, what happened then was, so I'm doing this surgery and things and I was not happy with it, so that's why I was looking for the, this other solution. And somewhere around the, it was in, in the spring of 1975, that I, right in front of the Smithsonian is, is the mall, where it's, it's big open space and, and uh, pathways. And there's a lot of uh, uh, runners that go back and forth, and people come out there. In the U.S. Know, English, you call it a mall? Yes, call oh, them all. Okay, so but otherwise for probably the rest of the world it would be the park. Yeah, sort of. <laughs> okay. But this, the mall, the, the, well, the, the, what we call the mall in this area, it's a big park area that's in front of the museums that extends from the capital, uh, you know, the United States Capitol, to the Washington Monument, which is a mile away, and then from the Washington Monument to the Lincoln Memorial is another mile. So it's a, so it's like a, effectively you can imagine it's it, it's a well it's a two mile two mile long stretch of the relatively open parkland sort it's, of you know, cultivated it, yes, and obviously yes and with museums lining one one end is mm. all museum and the other is a lot of statues and things like that so in front of these these are there's walk big walkways and people. You know, uh, run an exercise on it. It's that time of the year. People were out there galore, and people had lunch. And I went out to sit on the bench in front of the museum and have lunch, which is what I did. And I'm watching it, and so I'm looking down one end at, at the Washington Monument, which is 555 foot tall. And I, by that time, I you know, know the Washington Monument. It's five foot thick at the top and 30 foot thick at the base. You see, and it's a rich, and this is the model that we use for the body. It's yeah, that's true. So, by washing the monument is, is, is the obelisk, it, right? So it's it, an obelisk. It's a 550 foot tall stone obelisk that goes up there, and it, but it's, you know, it's built like, it's, you know, thick at the base, and, you know. So, it, everything that you would expect from the column. Everybody. So, I'm looking, and, and there's, you know, that's the classic, and of course, Often a little bit of the distance around Washington, you could easily see all these um, construction cranes out there. Mm. So I'm looking at these two. I said, "Well, obviously, we must be like the construction crane." So you preferred the construction crane to the obelisk as your first kind of take on the model. Yes. So, but but thinking of a construction crane, it's not that you were thinking of the counterbalancing of of the no. lever effect on the you know, on the weight load that goes at the bottom, or what was, what I was... was I was thinking of the airy structure that was... Airy, so that was like right. scaffolding type the of... Scaffolding thing, and I recognized it as a triangulated structure, and I knew I was looking for some sort of truss system, because mm. I had already been looking and saying, this has to be a truss system that's holding us up. Okay, so uh, let me just maybe indicate a few points there. So when we speak about the crane, right, so we actually take what you just mentioned, a, a, number, a number of things. So one is the truss as the specific architecture, right, but then if we start looking in the, in drive this comparison, so what is the first visual thing? It's actually the airiness of the crane versus the monolith, monolithic, uh, const well, monolith, monolith of the of, of the obelisk, right? right? And then, respectively, what it leads us to is that crane is much more architecture, you know, architectural thing, or rather than material based, while, whilst the granite uh, obelisk is really heavily dependent it's, on the properties of the uh, material, material itself. It's a material thing. So that's where we really have to probably emphasize these two points. So the airiness as the material. Are, and architecture is the structural 
stiffness of the whole thing versus just the material part. Right, so we get this uh, construction crane, this tall thing that goes up in the air with a fraction of the weight mm. of the Washington Monument. And doing essentially the same thing going up there. But not only that, you can get this long arm coming off that crane that you couldn't possibly get off the Washington Monument. Mm -hmm. I mean, be a flagpole on the Washington Monument so it puts stress on it. So, so you can get this long pole and maybe figure out some way of balancing it. Mm. And it was clearly a truss system that did it. And again, this long arm that goes out there is also airy, light and airy. Mm. It's, it's relative material-wise, it's, it's very light as compared to any other kind of construction. Mm. So I, I recognize that. The problem was, uh, as I kept saying, how do I get this thing to change position, to move, to turn it upside down and right side up, and I couldn't figure that out. So that, once again, that was one of the key troubles there for you, right? Is that whether we were getting back to the dinosaurs with the image of the super high masts to, to stabilize right. it, and then the, 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 you know, the ship that the, the vessel that goes on the side is helpless, the same thing with the cranes. Right. So the moment they get tipped over, uh, it's helpless. Right. And it, not only does it help, if you get one of those cranes tip over, they fold up. They don't just fall over. So they actually buckle on top they of it. So buckle, it becomes a mess. Mm. So, so, so that, you know, but it, it was obvious that the basic structure, had to, in my mind, had to be triangulated in some way. And I couldn't figure out how to get one that went upside down and right side up, and you know, and stay stable in all directions. Because every time you turn a, a truss system over, the, what becomes tension is, becomes compression, and vice versa. I mean, that didn't work. I think that this is a really important thing that we, 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 we it deserves to be highlighted there, right? because of course you know we have to realize that among our viewers, the word truss is not. On their on the tip of their tongues on an everyday basis. So in that sense, visualizing the crane, or you know this type of the railway right. bridges and so on as the first image is is very helpful. But I think that what you mentioned just now. So we highlighted the fact that it's much less on the material, like a lot of lighter in area, right? So you see, then it's the alternating the compression and tension depending on the loads. Yeah, but then, which, you, which you don't see because it, when they build these things, they built it out, it's all steel when they build it. Mm. See, but some of that is under tension and other parts of it are under compression. But it's not clearly visualized when you see it in a crane. That's a very good point because you see, when otherwise when we think about the crane, because it's still, it's steel, Right, so it's right. steel, it's steel and steel, right? right. So it's a S T I L and it's S T double E L, right? right? So we, it's natural to feel okay if it's made out of steel. It's just the strength of the steel which holds it together. So right. you kind of you, natu by first impression, you don't change your perception away from this compression system. But what you mention here is that those things, the moment the balance changes a bit, they warp collapse, right. distort, so that still as a material is unable to hold it. Right. So they're way beyond the resistance capacity of, this, of, steel. of steel. Steel. It's the structure that's important. Mm. So I think that this is really, really important because otherwise, you know, when we deal with the smaller systems, right, you can say, you know what, sometimes you see the, uh, you know, you see the telegraph or whatever this electric pole, you know, made out of, say, concrete, but they for they were for saving or the materials, they start making holes into it. Right. So just to kind of to lighten it up, but it's still a compression system. Right. So right. with the cranes, even though they're made of steel, it's a very different thing. So it's beyond, you know, the realistic capacity of steel alone, you know, as a material just to hold it. So it's actually very strongly, it's the architectural in the first place. Right. So great. Now, again, this goes back to my college physics because. Mm. There's a picture in the book of this kind of where the, in a, in a truss system, where it's divided, the tension and, and compression separate from one another. Mm. And it's in the book, and you know, so it was another picture in my mind that stuck in my mind. And so 
I understood this concept that, you know, even though it's made of steel, it's, that steel is under tension. It's not being compressed. Part of that is under tension, part's under compression. And then when you turn it around, it, it what, you know, the machine, that one that's built out of steel will work, still work if you turn it on its side, mm -hmm. in some sense. But if it's tension things, if, it, if I replace them with wires instead of a solid piece of steel, it couldn't work anymore. Mm. And that's where the problem was in my mind. Okay, so, I, okay so in that sense, your, your first image was actually quite straightforward. It was quite straightforward steel bones and muscles kind oh, of yeah. visualization it's, it's, in that it's, sense. Yes. So where the, you know, this sort of, in a truss it would be the idea, of, still the idea of bones as a sort of the replica of the struts and the muscles as those wires, right? So Absolutely, it's that's the way I was thinking. So it was quite, it was relatively straightforward and intuitive in that sense. Right? Yeah, just I'm, basically I'm, shifting anatomy I'm there. I'm still in gross anatomy and I'm mm -hmm. just thinking of bones and muscles and ligaments. So, okay, and fantastic. So in that sense, you're looking at the crane, you say, okay, the crane is a, is a kind of, sim it's a material, it's a material continuity there, it's the same, and it's a strong material, but if we were to, so therefore the same, you know, steel uh, beam can do both functions, it could right. be still working as in a, you know, depending, it can work in the compression right. and in tension, right. so, and in flipping the roles, but if you were sort of then thinking, okay, how we, we replace a designated tensional element like a muscle, so then it wouldn't be able to do the compression right. thing, so that is, Naturally, it would have just collapsed, like right. whatever the the losing the losing thing. So I, right. great, great. So, right. I, so I, this this I, where yeah, this is what you would have been bugged with. Yes. So okay, so fantastic. Like, yeah. Uh, how do I get this thing to turn upside down? Mm. So, and so, and not to buckle. And not buckle. Mm. So, so I was sitting, actually sitting on a bench having lunch. Okay. Right there. Do you remember what you had for lunch? I don't remember how. Uh, what did you usually have? Sandwiches. Yeah, well, there was a little, there was a little, uh, there's, and still is a little stand there where you can buy some things, and I may have had a hot dog or something. Okay. Around. There was also a, in those days, there was a model of uh, a Triceratops outside, right sitting there, big, you know, full scale Triceratops with, with uh, you know. The, but the plastic made. Yeah. Not, not the, not the no, fossils. No, yeah, and no, yeah, no, it wasn't the bones. It was, a, you know. A, Fiberglass thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Big, big, big. So sitting right, I'm sitting right next to the Triceratops, and we're, you know, sitting on the bench there and watching people run back and forth, and watching the Washington Monument, and I suddenly realized that across the way from me is the Hirschhorn Museum, and a year before I had seen the Snelson's Tower, which is how tall is that? Sixty foot. 60 foot which makes 18 meters so it's like almost 20 meters which is uh, the equivalent of the say six stories tall building right so which right. is tall enough in that sense 20 tall enough compare yeah. if you it's already enough to give you a, a big tipping you know the, the big tipping at the top and so on okay right. great so if we were to build a column which was uh, equivalent in, in height you would already see a meaningful difference between the the circumference at the top. It would need substantial pedestal, you know, substantial base. Yeah, and it would need side wires going out to each side. It would need a lot of support, kind mm. of thing. Well, so I just ran across the mall, which you know, and because the park, okay, so yeah, 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 okay, yeah, yeah, across, across the mall, yes, across the park, you know, the the national. It's called the National Mall, and I ran yeah. across the National Mall. And there was the you know, the tower, so I then spent a lot of time with the tower. And there's but it had a free access at that point, so you can go it, under it, you know, around yeah, it. Yeah, you can go under it, and, and so you can't, you couldn't touch it in those days. At least officially. Oh, it was. It's in the. It, I put it there. Excuse no. me, all right. We'll have to do a cut. Okay. Sorry.
right. So um, we're very, very quickly going to go into episode five. So hang on. I love this stuff. Thanks, everyone. Okay, so now we have a good opportunity to help again get a transition from the your mind's eye into some visuals using this nice, okay. elegant, bright oranges, which are going to give us some ideas of how these things would be like assisted in understanding. All right. Well, I don't have. Wait, well, here's a triangle. You can see structurally, the triangle is a stable structure even though it has these flexible hinges. If I put another stick in there and make, oops, make it a fourth one, it becomes very unstable. The whole thing is very sloppy. So unless it's triangulated, uh, let me get this together here, you can see that just three like this is unstable and it gets floppy, but you hook them together at a point okay. and it's rigid and stays together. The problem is that if you put it with a string on it, uh, you can't turn it this way because that becomes wait, a wait, string. Wait, wait, wait. We got the, the green what, string. Green, the green string. Green that string. That one right there. All right. So here's one. This is one with the string, and so that if you replace the rigid one with a tension one, because this is under tension as you push it down on it. It doesn't work when you turn it on its side. So I had to find a model that was... So effectively, we are talking about this, right? So you see, when you put the load, so it, it's a load which is directional, right? So right. You see, if I, for, within that structure, so effectively, if the load comes from the top and the orientation is like this, then the distribution puts this element the element, the regardless of yes. the material, right. so structurally right. it goes under tension. Yes. So in that situation, placing the wire there is the well the tensional element. Mm -hmm. So right. and the tensional embodiment, right? right? So the structurally tensional and tensional embodiment, embodiment, it works just fine. But then if we flip it, now this element becomes a compressional element. element. So if we keep the tensional embodiment there, then the thing doesn't work exactly and that was and unlike the rigid one the three point there oh, where that one floated away oh, no, 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 the, the one without the the the, the wire. here we go yeah here we go so and this one if we distinguish the embodiment the embodiment from the structure so that means that now okay this is the yellow thing these are the two black ones the two black nodes so that means that if i put the load from the top then this element is structurally in tension okay. so which is the nature of the right. truss in that sense but also as a material this is the thing which is inextensible and in you know like it doesn't change it's a permanent in length right, right? so but then now that was the yellowish thing to blackish thing so the two blackish were under tension now if i change it so what we have now these two blackish they go under compression so compression structurally but then as an element itself it's you know it's still is the same material element so therefore it can survive the flip of the role. So whether it was in the tension role or whether it's in compression role, this permanent the permanence of the material in that sense saves the day. Right. And this replacement, so effectively at that point you were really visualizing this kind of models in a very simple way that those would be bones in some kind of combination and that would be bones plus muscles. 
Exactly. So that's yeah. what your was with your line of thinking and in that flip of the role between the structural and the structural tension and the structural compression that would bug you. Right. It meant that the muscles had to become bones of instantaneously. Instantaneously flip into the bony state. It didn't make any sense. Okay, great. All right. So I was stuck with that model. But when I you know, so I recognized that the Snelson model tower didn't do that. That tension remained tension and compression remained compression, no matter which way you turned it. So you had a model like this, which is similar to the Snelson Tower, and it doesn't make any difference. Tension and compression remain in the model, no matter what, how you turn it. Whether you put it on the side, whether you put it on, right on side, at an angle, and so on. So. It doesn't make any difference. It all, all tension remains in tension, compression remains in compression within the model. So, but at the same time, this thing doesn't reduce itself to a flat model that we just used, right? So you see, in that respect, you can't reduce it to the 2D flat version. Right. So that's another interesting yeah, element that this thing volume. is, that this is inherently volumetric. Inherently volumetric, inherently stable. It has just tension and compression. The, the, the tension and compression are separated. It's actually, it's a truss system. Mm. It's, it's it's like the bridge, only it's, it's a truss system, so it's re, just replaced in such a way that that you don't have to keep changing what's in tension and what's in compression, but it's all triangulated. Okay, so I really want to emphasize this. In that sense, in just what we are trying to do here, we are relieving the story here. So relieving this build of initial dissatisfaction, the build of anxiety, the model, you know, the crane and the truss system with the alternating tension and compression, structural compression phases, and growing dissatisfaction with this that, well, you know, in that anatomically, you saw the presence of two different elements and the string didn't fit anywhere effectively right you know, so it didn't the string didn't fit very well into the structure into the compression model right it didn't fit so and then that's where this realization came up as such a eureka moment because to have a eureka moment, you have to build the anxiety before. It's not like a passing thing, you know, because before you walked past it, right, and you didn't uh, think about it twice, right. Just thought it was an interesting thing, and I didn't understand it from the physics standpoint, but it was interesting. But it was that's it. Okay, great. So now, yeah, I mean, instantly it became the model for the spine. I was comfortable with that. So but your first got, focus was the spine, yeah, because you were practicing. That's you, what I was doing, the spine. It was basically a spine thing. Mm. So I had to, but then, you know, very quickly realized, well, okay, okay, no, 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 that, okay. That's, not, that's too quick, you know. Yeah. Okay, so let's get it there. So this, here you are thinking about it. So your first focus was the spine. Yes. So that was the click that, in fact, realizing, but you know, let's, let's add some tangible elements. So uh, if we get to our readers, right, or our viewers, so they would instantly visualize the anatomical spine, right? So the, the disc, the, verte uh, the disc, the vertebra, right. the disc, the vertebra, all the, you know, all the uh, facet joints and all the processes. So they would say, hey, Dr. Levin, but you visualized it here, but I don't see any discs, I don't see any vertebral bodies here, I mean, I don't see any processes. Like, how did you make this uh, bold assumption? So, like, what did you, you know, what made you think about it? And what, and what were your first thoughts and kind of in placing the anatomy into the thing? Uh, yeah, I didn't, I didn't. I didn't do anything with the anatomy initially. Okay, so initially I I saw this as a structure. I said this is the way the spine must work. So sure. you first focused on it as the architectural uh, principle, uh, the architectural, principle. rather than thinking about the specific embodiment. Right. I didn't. You know. I said we got bones and we got tensional elements. You know. 
this is the way the spine's got to work. Okay, I think that, that that's a very important thing. So, you see, because a lot of people in our profession, and actually all around, you know, they have a tendency to think in a very concrete shapes. So, like, okay, especially, you know, getting, trying to get this type of visuals and so on, so that it, in order to get anywhere close to being connected and linked to the model, then you want, say they, they want the resemblance. Right. So I want to highlight this, that first your click there was on, this is very much similar to the Snelson Tower, right? Right. So it's like what we're seeing here. So you clicked on it without planting the specific shapes of the vertebra, without planting the disc there, without asking your question, yourself a question, where is the vertebra, where is the disc, where are the processes? Correct. I did not, I was not that concerned about the actual structure, which was, which was doing what to whom. You were not saying, oh, no. this strut resembles me the bone, and this strut resembles me the bone. No, I knew that functionally it had to be that way, so, but not it didn't have to exactly look that way. Okay, so right away you were focused on the function and the mechanical behavior of this the entire the entire system well ahead of the you know you were not kind of trying to arise from okay this is the specific shape of the vertebra this is this and this and this and this so how we, we construct something out of this specific shape of the vertebra so you are looking at it from a different way, what we just spoke about more with the cranes and this principle that there is a, that in terms of the structure there's a tension element, there's a compression element and they could interchange depending on the load. Yes. So in that sense you are not really attached to the embodiments, you are much more connected to the actual structure and the architecture. Am yes. I correct with that? That's correct. In fact, Frankly, I don't really like these models that look exactly like, uh, or... The, you don't like the resemblance, because I, the resemblance... Because the resemblance... By, by these models, you mean this type of model? Yes, this type of model is not my favorite kind of model. Mostly because we don't have anything by that really easily looks like this. Fantastic. I think that this yeah. is really, really a big point. Because, you see, what, where we are stuck here is that the, the, the usual argument from the people in our profession and around in biomechanics, you know, and we kind of take it this way, goes this way. This is a kind of resemblance, but this resemblance is not perfect. You know, it doesn't right. respect all the particular lines, nooks and crannies, so this is an oversimplified model oversimplified model for the person who tries to get the anatomical embodiment and then they say well you know okay maybe the blah, 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 blah. but the thing is that right from the start for you so you see for them for the people with this concrete thinking they say well this model is better than this model for them because this is right. greater resemblance right. But they're still not happy with the full resemblance and the, the people with the degrees in biomechanics, they want the specific measurements and the, and the points of attachments and, the, and so on. But I think it's really critical to highlight for us that right from the start it was the search for the architectural principle and for the system which is going to uh, recollect the, the actual you know, like behavior of it with flexible embodiments as opposed to trying to build it up from the ground up out of the existent anatomy. I think that this is really really essential thing. So great. So let's kind of get further. Right. Well of course So you're sitting there and well, just I had I didn't know what this was. I just knew it was these bones. So I had to figure understand it. I didn't know anything about by Mr. Fuller. And he, what what I did know was geodesic domes, but I I didn't know anything about that. He was connected to this, so you knew yeah. the geodesic domes from the, his exposure with the, for his fame yeah. with Montreal right. Expo. Exactly, and so. but I knew nothing about this this aspect of it. So I started studying it, and I couldn't figure it out. So I ended up uh, calling Snelson in the studio in New York and asking him things, and then he pointed me towards Fuller. 
Okay, okay, okay. Let, 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 let's let's right. let's hold your horses okay. there. Okay. And not not let's not right. do any fast forwarding. Okay, so here we are, spring seventy five. Right. You're looking at Snelson's Snelson structure. Mm -hmm structure right so you see not the embodiment the structure, no, structure. here right the structure, structure. by structure. the word structure we mean it's it's material plus architecture where architecture plays greater role so right. and then you connect this with the structure of the spine as a mechanical right. behavior principle right so this is like a light bulb goes on and you nearly choke on your hot dog am i correct right okay <laughs> so and so you chew the rest of the hot dog mm -hmm. and then you say, okay, Mr. Levin, you know, what's the, what am I going to do with this next? Right. So what were the next moves? Well, I, I'm trying to understand how this thing is built. Because so are you I, going home all excited, you know, like driving? Well, yeah, well, I went home and I, yeah, but I could, you know, I'm trying to f understand this structure. At that point, did you have anybody to talk to? No, see? there was nobody to talk to. So it's just kind of you yourself and you, you know. So, you know, so I'm just, and there was no computers in those days, you know. No internet, obviously. No, no internet, no computers, no, I mean, no compute, nothing at all. So I'm, I'm trying to understand the structure. I didn't know so the, your only source of new information would be the library, potentially. Well, actually, I didn't even do that. I I went to the Hirshhorn Museum people and to try and find out more stuff. Ah. Okay, now so it's you, that's you your modus Hirshaw, operandi. You go to Hirshhorn Museum. You say, for, for you know, you're only talking to the people in the bookstore there. They don't know what's going on in the guards. So you finally have to dig out somebody in a Hirshhorn who could tell you something about the artist. Okay, so that's how it All went. Right. So, it, so it was similar to your way how you approached the dinosaurs. You basically called the switchboard and said, "Who is going to help you with this?" Exactly. So they point me. Actually, I think they point me to the Knox Museum in New York, which is up in Buffalo, and then the Buffalo people point me back to New York City, where Snelson's studio was. Okay, but Snelson, was he famous artist at that point? He was oh, in a way. The fringes or? No, he was, in a, he was already well known, like the Knox people up in, in Buffalo had an exhibit of it. Hirshhorn, who donated millions of dollars to the to build the museum already had this sculpture he had a he had a big estate and this was on his estate. Okay, so Hirshhorn is, is, is a famous is a philanthropist, right? right. So yes. so he was a sort of patron of Snelson in that way, so he brought right. this thing from you. So he had this on his estate. When he established the museum he had him move to the museum. Okay. And donated to the museum. So it was a peg it was the whole peg the part of the, the whole estate and donation right. that came in. Exactly. Okay. So it was That's part it. of that thing. So so as this is so I had to bounce around to the museum to yeah. You Knox know, Studio is actually is a sells these things. You know, I mean it's a, a commercial studio. Mm -hmm. So so I so they pointed me back to Snelson, they gave me his phone number. Ah, they gave you this one. Yeah, so that was they, before the data protection. Right, right. So the personal right, data protection. Well, because they're 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 the business people, you see. They're the Knox art, Studio. The Knox Studio, that's what I said. They 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 were sellers. They were selling these things, my own thing. Okay. For the, 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 so, okay. So he so anyway, so I told yeah, I kept Everything, all of this was always with the story. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I'm interested in this. And yeah, this yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, that's, I mean, so you go through that spiel with each other. No, but that, that's an interesting spiel. I mean, what was the spiel actually? I mean, what I'm, was that? He's, you know, I'm curious I'm an to hear that. I'm an orthopedic surgeon, and I I see this as a potential model for the spine, mm -hmm. and I want to know more about the structure, and so I need to speak to the artist. Okay, so that was the, that was your. So, way through the door, okay. Right, so I'm, you know, I'm making all these phone and long distance phone, and I'm not a phone person, and I'm making all these long distance phone calls at the Buffalo, and the, then we get back up to New York, and I get the all this Nelson, who is and, very nice, and you give him the same spiel, same spiel, and okay. so he says, oh, that's very interesting. A lot of people are thinking about things like building bridges with this, and all that. It doesn't work. <laughs> okay. Ah, that's what he told you. Yeah. Okay. So he told you that the initial, that basically kind of stopped you a bit short in your tracks in by way, saying that that right. the archi he says, that this, this is, I'm an artist. This is an art piece, and I it's not strong enough for a structure. He says, but yeah, you know, he says you want to know more about it. Maybe look into B Buckminster Fuller. Well, I think Buckminster Fuller just about came out that time, but but actually I went to. Um, 
uh, Hugh Kenner's book, uh, Bucky, which is out of print now, but it's a much easier book to read. It's about Buckminster Fuller. And uh, what was the name of the book? Bucky, I think it's called, just called Bucky. Ah, so it's, it's, is it his or it's about him? It's, he's it's about a, him. It's written by a fellow named Hugh Kenner, who happened to be up in Baltimore, so I called him. <laughs> okay, now let's, let's, let's follow this trick. Let's follow this trick. Okay, so you, the book called Bucky, so which, right. which describes the phenomenon of Buckminster Fuller. And he describes that he goes into tensegrity because it's very hard to get this out of Fuller's book. Until you understand more about it, so uh, you mean out of Fuller's book, the, the synergetics. Synergetics. Okay, so yeah. that was your, that was you kind of you went the way, so you you then called to the author. Yeah, well, yeah, well, I got yes, I got to you, Kenner, because I'm, and and you know, and again, and got his book, and I'm not sure all the the little details about it, but mm -hmm. I ended up going through his book, and in his book, there is a section on how to build a tensegrity. Uh huh, and that was my first tensegrities, and then he talks about building it with sticks and wire, not with elastic. Mm -hmm. Sticks and wire. Yeah. So I never. But built... there were no pre-built kits there, oh, which was no, supplied. No so you had to do no. things. You had to do the things yourself. Yeah. There, mm -hmm. was, there was no pre-built. So I'm building this. So, so I then got into building that and. As but what were, what were you building there? The icosahedrons, the, the towers? I, I was just he had a he had a, a six struck icosahedron, which is the basis for these towers. Mm -hmm. He started adding them up. Anyway, so uh, so he has it. So I started building tensegrities then, and I was playing all, trying to do all sorts of combinations of it, and building. How long did that take approximately in this this, this well, space? The way this now is extending into the summer, and you know, it's now going on. This is a, this is piece by piece by piece. Okay, so we we, we so don't then know. Then I started still working in. with two. Well, that's it. I got after from Bucky. I started when I read Fuller's book. I started working with toothpicks and raisins, which was his thing. So I'm understand toothpicks and raisins. Yeah, because you're making it. But you're making icosahedrons with it, and I saw the relationship between the icosahedrons and the six strut tensegrity. Now let's let's hold your horses again here. All right, so we're going to take about a 10 minute break because that was a lot. <laughs> you know, Doug, I'm like you every time I'm getting new things out of this. Um, and I don't know if anybody has questions or anything. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah. Hi, thanks, Susan. Steve, I'm really, really curious to hear you talk about your experience when you first tried to share this. I mean, you've been trying to find a solution to this anxiety, as Leonid calls it, for a significant period of time, which made you ripe and ready to, to see the solution when it was there. And I imagine you being super excited and rushing home to share it talking to anybody you could did but i imagine that people weren't ready to hear what was your experience well it was i know i knew that i built the better mousetrap and i expected everybody to say oh it's the perfect mousetrap and get rid of all the other mousetraps and so i ran to people actually i, I went to some engineers who were working in the government, I think, or something. I try I don't even remember, but he, and I so I brought it to the engineers. They said, look what we got here. And they said, son, and of course I was already 10 years older than the guy who said, son, son, you have to go to engineering school for five years before you can talk about this. 
So I then, yeah, I, mean, I was, and that from then on, that's what I kept getting. And anytime I presented at any place with the biomechanics people or engineering people, and I, you know, I joined engineering society, the International Society for uh, Biomechanics, the American Society of Biomechanics. Biomechanics for engineering and medicine. I, I, you know, I did it all, and I kept joining these organizations, trying to get them to accept this or at least hear about it. And I would nobody took a bite. It was, I mean, I was a fish hook that no fish wanted a bite onto. Nothing. So I mean, I just had the wrong bait. I did the so then I started going into system science kind of concepts, and that's where I got acceptance. Um, my wife at the time, who has since passed away, but was a she was a social worker, and I was trying to explain it to anybody. I'm explaining it to my wife, who was a social worker, and she says. Well, you're talking about uh, uh, Bernard Lanphy stuff. I said, who's he? She said, well, Bernard Lanphy is big in social work because it talks about the hierarchy of family and the community and things like that. So she's big. So, but he talks about system science. So I got Bernard Lanphy's book and read that, which is the basic of system science. I mean, he is. He was system science, and he organized an organization called the International Society, at least for system science. So I joined that, and they were the only people who listened to me. And I loved these people, and they had no idea what I was talking about. But they said I was right because it was this systems thing that sounded right. <clears throat> so it wasn't the engineering that excited them. It was the concept of this systems that are fitted to a system. But nobody paid any attention to me. <clears throat> and they still don't. Which which must have been, you know, some time from that first eu eureka moment to find them. Uh, oh yeah, this this was a series of that took years of bouncing back and forth. I was still in practice, you know, doing doing my medical things and on the side doing these other things. And do you have salient memories of the first people that you were talking to that really started to get excited about biotensegrity as, as a model that applies to, to either just the human body or all of biology? Yeah, well, the Rolfing, <clears throat> excuse me, the Rolfing community picked up on it and I wrote in their article, but I never was asked to go to any of their offing meetings and talking about, about until much later. Um, but they did get a, I did get an article in a journal, their journal because the head of physical medicine at the hospital I was doing my surgery in was also a Rolfer. So he introduced me to the Rolfing concept. And actually the um, Ida Rolf was the first one who connected tensegrity and, and biomechanics as such she just never she mixed metaphors so it didn't quite work but but at least she thought about the concept and some of the rolfing people and i didn't know this at the time i did my work but some of the rolfing people were already talking in that about some of the tensegrity stuff so it was already in the rolfing community but uh, it was still very vague in their concepts and not everybody in rolfing did it so it was there in the Rolfing community, yet it took you to really take this concept and expand it and deepen. Yeah, that. they they were mixing it from Ida Rolf, and Ida Rolf was very rigid in her belief of how this body was built. That in order to be a tensegrity, you had to be perfectly lined in this Rolfing concept, and then you were a tensegrity. But she didn't understand about how to move it or anything like that. It was this very fixed concept of the spine and the upright spine. And then you were a perfect tensegrity. So although some of the 
people who work with her started working into, into it and trying to play around with it. She actually kept them from really expanding their thoughts because she's always bringing back to her model of the spine and it has to be this. Right, but, wait, which, which taps into one of the, the discussions we were having just this week about, you know, this, can you have more or less of a tensegrity and all of that? But Susan, I'm going to pass things back to you. Yeah, well, I just wanted to say, right, is don't, don't forget that the Rolfing people, they were using the tensegrity. They didn't get the concept of bias tensegrity, right? So that's really... Right. It was, it was a, this spine as a tensegrity column was where they were stuck. And it only worked when it was perfectly aligned, which, of course, is not the whole thing about a tensegrity column. It's, the, it's exactly opposite. You don't have to be that kind of aligned. Yeah, actually, you know, I must say that, you know, just getting back to the point of rewatching it. So I really wanted to highlight this point, right? Is that this transition from column to truss, right? So it's like as a first step, but then the truss is being in that status of alternating the structural and the, and the you know, the material embodiment and the structural role, right? Depending on how you flip it, it becomes either goes either in tension or in compression. But this is really a critical step about the tensegrity that it has, you know, it keeps this internally, right? It's not dependent on the external roles. Although, of course, at the next level, when we will move heterarchically, we would say that yes, within the tensegrity, within as the kind of next level of specialization, specializing, or like next level of behaviors, the struts can become the, the, uh, the strings, right? And the strings can become the struts, right? So you see, in that sense, it's also flippable, but it's a, it's a different type of flip compared to the like slack uh, story of the, uh, you know, of the trust. So I think that that's really something which has to be very clearly recalled. You brought out a, a very important point when we were having that discussion that I really hadn't thought about before was that once I got the structure, this contextivity model, I wasn't concerned about the anatomy. I hmm. didn't say it, 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 I didn't think of this I just thought in general terms of bones, meaning compression elements and tension elements, but I wasn't saying this bone does this and this bone does that. It just never occurred to me. I mean, that I said those things have to fit into the model, not the other way around. Yeah, yeah. You were not trying to kind of reconstruct it from the just a collection of elements and say, okay, so this is a skeleton, you know lying in the, on the floor, let's sort of try to assemble them together and ex calculate the exact forces on the exact, you know, prominences and uh, all of the all of the attachments and so on. So that is, uh, I think it, that's really the key. And um, unfortunately, it's where we, uh, you know, where we miss... I, I, Where we miss when we get too much of the concreteness. And don't forget, Chris, right? So you see, that was pre-internet, right? So that, that was, um, yeah, we, we forget, actually. We forget that how different things were in the pre-internet. And for, and for me, uh, one of the interesting things that your conversation, the two of you brought out, is and I, I think somewhere Steve says I knew that it had to be about the function, the process, the the behavior, as you say, Leonid. And you know, for that to have been part of what you were looking for right from the beginning, Steve. When now uh, certainly we've been talking about process ontolo ontology and such, it's interesting for me to hear that that was part of what you were looking for way back before I even had any idea of any of this stuff personally yeah which which actually creates problems right so you see because basically you know 99 point whatever 99 people in our profession are like i don't know how to call it but they are super materialistic you know 
they could be spiritual as they as you know whatever as 10 churches but uh, at the same time they're so super materialistic and so stuck on anatomy that this part you know looks like this has this shape has to fit there and tell me exactly how it works you know like it's this you know this clinging to resemblances is just the thing that has been driving me nuts for you know okay it's been driving me nuts for 30 years right <laughs> so you see, i assume that people who had longer experience with being driven nuts on this sort of attachment to resemblances okay so uh on that note i'm going to clarify one point and we're going to get on to number six and then we'll have time for all this stuff uh when steve's talking about the toothpicks and the peas anybody who has uh, my book raisins raisins uh toothpicks and raisins right um right froebel used uh softened peas steve was using toothpicks and raisins i usually use mini marshmallows although these days i'm see me looking down and moving things around i'm using these little magnet things which are really really useful and you you learn through your fingers how the forces work and balance when you start building those triangles and tetrahedrons uh so that's what they were talking about anyway Let's all uh, turn our cameras off and mute, and I will uh, screen share uh, episode six. See you in a few. Sorry about that. I had it at the end. Here we go. Okay, so we are on a roll and we're really getting into a very interesting thing here. So I still want to emphasize that for our beloved viewers right so that we are having a very important transition here when first you were dissatisfied by the more sort of embodiment based understanding that you know that muscles as a say in, in anatomical embodiment of the muscles attentional element didn't really fit very well with uh, the replacement in the strut model like which it came from the crane but then so this is a really huge leap here because you really shifted there from the embodiment towards the structure yes so even so and, and i think that that's important to understand that your first link there and that big leap was towards the spine regardless of the anatomical environment so that was a huge leap towards the towards the structural representation of the me mechanical behavior so now with this well, in mind let's yeah. keep going what, what i noticed since things were since these compression elements the, the what we would think of as bones are sort of floating around i recognize that th this structure could be distorted in different ways and it didn't have to exactly look like this mm. that this you know the tension elements and the bone and the compression elements could be sort of are separate from another and it didn't exactly have to look like okay this. so in in that sense that there was a flexibility of the embodiments as that satisfies the structural principle right okay great so now we are there so we got some new information into into this so we're talking about the summer of 1975 so you track down to Snelson, he sort of just backed off, I'm just an artist, right. but he pointed you in the direction of Fuller, which you first read the book about Fuller, you started right. practicing with doing that in Secrets at Home, which we have the pictures, right. you know, somewhere in your archive, and we're going to show it right. at some point. 
so and now let's keep the focus so what you were getting out of the models and how your further thought went through well I, I quickly recognized that I had this structure and how do I get to this structure how does it how does it create how is it created and you know how do we get a, a, you know, a whole stack of these things going and I said well it has to be an evolution thing so I have to start it at the at the ground floor and I have to understand it not as this structure but at the cell structure at least the cell structure okay ground floor figuratively or yeah, figuratively at okay. the beginning it couldn't start as a spine it had to develop into a spine so I had to understand the embryological development of the structure interesting so meaning that that's where so the embryological thought came in quite early oh yeah it had I mean I knew, you know, I had this structure, I knew that was the structure of the spine. Instinctively, that's it. So that but was... The, 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 you know, the physical, but I had to understand how it got to be that. So, by it got to be there, that's a more general thing within yeah. biology, how it, the thing evolved in this Right, in I this need direction. to know the embryological involvement of this structure. Now, an interesting point. So, but have you had any prior embryological interest, any prior bio no, embryological I had, experience? I had my embryology course in medical school. Which is like maybe what? It's a few months, three months or four months. So if we have a class that's part of the, you know, in sequence, but it's a class that extends over four. So, months. which is usually quite a small class, and most people yeah, just it, pass it on, yeah, you know, just another, get the marks, it, and that's it. Yeah, it's another one that gives you some background information. So, in that respect, if we kind of trace the timeline, you took that course in the middle of fifties, right? And now we're in the middle of seventies, right? So, it's a twenty years in between when you didn't have much of interest in embryology in right. the embryology per se true so and suddenly the link starts working saying hey maybe i have to revisit my understanding of embryology am i correct well i have to i have to understand exactly i had to understand how this thing develops mm. yeah because i i mean you can you know it's not topsy it doesn't just grow Mm. It's, got, it's got to follow, it's got to get there somehow or other. So I couldn't say, how does, you know, you don't just grow a spine. It has to come from someplace. Mm -hmm. All right, so I, part of this is I told you I was looking into architecture and things like that. Right from the beginning, I knew there was architectural principle somewhere in there. And I came across a book in that library called Structure and Nature is a Strategy for Design by a fellow mm -hmm. named Peter Pierce. And we are back to our sort of hotbed of thinking, which is the Smithsonian right. Museum and the bookstore at the, book at the ground, at, at the right. basement. Exactly. So we're back there. So it's right. kind of, we loop uh, this yeah, I never really left there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. you know, okay. It was part of what I was constantly playing back and forth because I'm doing, going, doing So work. you're still in that kind of hub, right. to say so. Right. so Anyway, so I got Peter Pierce's book. Do we have it somewhere? Yes, here? it's right, right where, right here now. Okay, so let's have a look the, at that. You can see oh wow, it's well read. I would well say read, it's, it's well sort of read. okay. It falls yeah, apart right, here. Right, and so like it's, 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 structure in nature is a strategy for design. design. Now, Peter turned, Pierce. Now it turns out that Peter Pierce was a fellow who did a lot of the illustrations for uh, uh, Synergetics, but Mr. Fuller's book, and was a student with a uh, Wow. Mr. Now, I didn't know that, and I, and I don't think it's mentioned anywhere even in his book. I, did, I found that out wow. later. Wow. This is impressive. But this was the book that laid it all out for me from the standpoint, but the, he's an architect, and he's using this these concepts to build buildings. So the last half of the book is about how to build a room or mm. building, but the first half goes through Buckminster Fuller's 
concepts in evolution. But this packing, the whole is. But this book layer. is from nineteen what seventy something? Yes. But it was but so it already it was already there. It was there. Okay. Uh, well, we lost that, those those pages. Yeah, but yeah, it's it's it, there's another copy of it over there. Okay. Um, so the, this book was already in print for a few years. I don't know how long it was in print. It was relatively new, I'm sure. But it was relatively new at the time. Yeah, MIT Press. MIT Press. So, but this oh, twelve. Twelve dollars fifty. Okay, so I see. I went to press. Yeah. Okay. Where can you get a book for twelve dollars fifty? <laughs> well, the you know, things have changed right. since then. Okay, so but he was quite famous architect. No, not, not then. He is now, <laughs> but not then. But so no, at but least, he, but but at least recognized enough to be published by, by yes, MIT. Exactly. So he wasn't yeah. like some offshoot no, there. No, and no, he was he was established. Mm -hmm. But he wrote this book, and, and in it he goes through this step-by-step -step evolution of close packing, you know, tensegrity, I mean, right at Bill, like isohedrons, tensegrity, spatial relationships, he does the whole thing and lays it all out. He said then, in the last part of the book, last half of the book, he's into the architectural application of it, but that first part of it lays out the, deve the natural development of structure. Okay. Yeah. You know, basically, like, you know, this is how it was, you know, mostly the close packing. So, of course, from there, I then went into several other books on the patterns in nature and things like that, and I looked into that. And then I go into, uh, you know, laws of close packing. I end up with foams and, um, you know, learning about how foams get together. And, you know, then. then uh, and we talk about the foams. That is still that period of time, you know, like the mid seventies. I yeah, yeah, the latter seventies. This this there was a five year period when I'm playing with all these things. Mm, okay, okay. And so I'm we, we bouncing from one to the other because each thing is leading me to another, and it's you know it's like a pinball machine because you, you it, it you're bouncing back and forth. So to give you exactly which I did first, I really can't tell you because. I was bouncing from one to the other. Okay, but in that sense, you still remember that it was this book. This was the. This was it. Th that this book is the one that actually made the click and kind of got it. Okay, that's realistic. That's right. nature connected. Right. Because he's building buildings with it. I said I can build a body with it. All right. So in that sense, when you first contacted Snelson, Snelson, when he was he was on a different tangent there. So right. kind of. Telling you that this wasn't very practical right. and so on. It's just you know I'm just an artist. Leave me alone right. on that. So right. this is where you found that it was related to nature. Right. And the key idea that he starts it with is the one of the more of the close packing itself. Right. So and then from close packing going into different assemblies and the structures which are actually re like corresponding. And fitting with the principle but, of the close but then, you know, so I bounce from him, I have Fuller's book, you can his book, you know, and then, and but then, going into nature things and all, you know, I was bouncing around to all the different directions, soaking up a little bit from everything. Okay, so I went back Full, to physics. I, yeah. So Fuller's book, synergetics, it came in nineteen seventy-five. So it's the same. It's the same year. Yeah. It's the same format it is. So you year. just kind of got yourself a mint, fresh printed edition of Absolutely. Synergetics. Right. Right. And this maybe, book was first published in 1978. Who? This one? Pierce. Pierce was first published in 78, so I'm... I, well, then how just let like you know. All right. Well, I, mean, I told you there's a five-year period where I'm bouncing around. But Catter's book on Bucky is published in 1973. Right, Bucky, so a guided tour of Buckminster Fuller. Right. So I did Buckminster Fuller. And that's why I said Bucky was first. Okay. And then I was building things, and then I started looking for it. So I was doing nature. I was I went into nature books, and I went into architecture books. It, but this book really sort of put it together for Okay, so I, I, okay, I see it this way. So if the book was, this was eventually from 78, so you bought, you bought it right there at the oh, yeah, and so on. So, it was, so that was a, a bit sort of after, so it means that you already read, or at least 
Oh, oh, went through syner forward. synergetics there. Yeah, I was already into the synergetics. Okay, okay. So, cool. so, but in that sense, this book, you, you remember it in a way that this is the book which actually, you know, written in a sort of more human language compared to synergetics. And more than that, it really got down... Fuller's book is not based on nature as such. That's right. This book is you know, linked it into the natural nature and made so, me understand it as a natural phenomenon. So to the point that this book became so important and informative that mentally you even kind of rewound the clock and put it even before it. So yeah. because it became really the, the centerpiece right, of understanding. Because, because this is the one where you begin to understand that this is a natural process that it is an evolution of structure. Mm -hmm. Even more, as I said, Fuller doesn't talk about it in that way. This book talked about it in that way. So that's the synergetics. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. So, here we are in that period, so we kind of got a little bit off, so now let's see, we are, you are there in, in that period of time so, but with the Applewhite, the co-author right. of, um, right. of of Fuller, when when did you that's, meet him? That's much later. Ah, that's much later. Much so, and that at that point, you only knew of him as a co-author of right. Uh, right. the Synergetics. Right. Okay. So now the window here is quite large. It's five years. But let, can we try to trace the ideas that you're understanding the structural principle here, the spine? So, are you bringing it? right away into the practice how is it kind of clicking there or it's still difficult yeah that's it's never been uh, it's a basic science and i recognize it it's, it's an, it gets you to understand it like you know you take a chemistry course and you say i took embryology and this fits into that kind of thing but it allows you to understand this as a structural unit instead of when you learn, you know, when, when we are doing biomechanics in the old system, you have this little thing of where you are and it's very localized and it's a local problem. In this model you see a more generalized situation and in manual therapy when you're doing that you understand the body as a functional unit. So you go back to still at the time and things like that which came along a little bit later for me mm -hmm. but going back into the history you see it as a, a, a functional unit okay but at the same time you're you are still being the practicing orthopedic surgeon yes so that's uh, so right. you, you're, you're doing the spinal surgeries and you're right. doing the, the those uh, knee surgeries yeah. and so and it got, it got more interesting then because when the arthroscope came in I could see things that you couldn't see before. So I could see joint spaces as a real space. Now, some of the early studies, I, 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 early on, I recognize part of this model is that the compression elements do not compress one another. So I tried to understand how that, you know, it didn't make any sense to me, of course. Well, so, wait, 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 once again, what did, did, let, let's elaborate okay, on this. Right. Didn't make any sense. So we get back to what you said several right. like uh, hours before when you know, describing the training of the orthopedic surgeon and the kind of the, the, lead, the leading train of thought is that we go down to the bone and we stay there. Right. So and we are fundamentally connecting the chain of bones together that they would be able to take loads. Exactly. So that's there. That's the background, that's, the, that's your yes. operational understanding yes. of the body. Essentially one block sitting on top of one block and another so, block. So that model was originally pre-embedded into you through natural thinking and through the, you know, through, through yeah, your learning, orthopedic yeah, training and, and environment. School and it went right through orthopedic training, yes. So how difficult was it to sort of shuffle and give some room uh, getting away from that like very deeply ingrained natural perception of the world. As I said, I, I was already nervous about the model. When I got a new model, it was very easy to give up the old one. Except 
that it sure looked like the bones were sitting on top of one another. So that's a, that's a slightly different train of thought there, yes. right? And, you know, if we get back to what the, when, con the conversation was about uh, Bernstein and Frankel, that, right. was, that they focused more on the hip joint. Right. So here, some other elements start kicking in. Okay, so, you, so then I get back to Grant's method of anatomy, and it's there that's, you know, you can see where this kind of model easily fits. Be okay, now, let me, let's get the book, please. Okay, so, right. so this we'll, is Grant's method of anatomy, yeah. and this is, this is the thing that you're actually referring to, right? So you see, you're referring to, you know, here, chapter 30, so just a very simple, explanation here which points out the the model of the hand and then emphasizes the role of the interosseous membrane right. between the radius and the ulna as the one which is doing the right. force and, transfer and when you do surgery at the radial head which i was doing mm -hmm. there's a space there all right and while i'm now thinking about it i said well let me try and close that space you, know, you, you talk about the radial head, the, the here, here, the radial you know, head, the here. elbow side, at the elbow, mm -hmm. and the, when you over operate on it for a fracture or whatever, it did, you know, which happens or something, you look in there and you see a space, and you just ignore it as a space because you assume that's going to close up when there's any load on it. Okay, right? I see. Mm -hmm. Well, then I would try and do things like try and close that space by pushing on the bone and trying to compress it. I couldn't get it to do that. You know, and then so you start playing around with the other bones and doing that sort of thing. Okay, I think that this is, let me, let me just pause here for a second. Because, you see, this is one of the points which is kind of highly contested there, and it's like, it's, it's well, as we know, through the, you know, integration and the communication of the, 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 the biotensegrity ideas, around it's a point which is still very difficult for a lot of people to take on board yes so therefore what i want to highlight first is that to begin with it was a difficult point for yourself very difficult so it, it went against your previous 25 years of actual training and uh, 20 years of, of well at least 15 20 years of practicing yes so and it sort of really started separating you from the train of thought which is really well deeply ingrained in your profession right so but then the second point which i believe is important here so what you were trying to when you were talking about that the joint spaces don't close i think you mentioned two important things so one you're operating and saying okay it's separated because I open it up, so it's sort of, right. it's it's a it's a it's a kind of aberration. It's, it's not, not a, it's not loaded. Yeah, it's not loaded. It's not it's, it's normal state. Right, right. So then, you did the next step and started testing the loads on it during the surgery. Correct. But of course, what I just want to highlight there is that some people take it to the extreme and say, well, you know, I want it to be like super loaded. Which I don't really understand, because the fact is that we're talking about the, the, the normal activity. Right. Of course, if you take a hammer, or if you kind of put whatever, some mega forces there, you can force them into one another, so that they will touch. You to practically have to tear the tissue to do that. So, but, but the fact is that what I want to highlight is that it's not that it's important. The importance there that there is a most of the normal like typical loads, right. typical interactions, the regular ranges of activity that the human body goes through. So that's where, you know, you get the open space. Right. So it doesn't close. So meaning that what we are talking about here, and that's what you connected to chapter 30, so it doesn't, it didn't bother you because you were already getting back to this book, which basically it was talking about the tensional right. pathways interosseous right. membrane and so, so so you were mentally okay with it because there was an alternative there was a tensional path 
that was actually doing the connection. Right. So you're not. Yeah, and it showed in the book, and it and it pointed out not just that there were a couple other places. Okay, great. So so in that sense, you were not like being a complete whatever rebel outsider or the person you know who just kind of you know just starts you know beating yourself on the chest saying well it doesn't work so you you really just link to the things which already existed there so right it's as a part of your training effectively right, right. It, you know right I just you know I went back to the book that told me how it worked and hmm. agreed with it Mm -hmm. you see and, and so so I see this space I said well that fits with the book and then you go up to the shoulder blade and you see exactly that the shoulder blade is floating on the on the body and it on the chest wall and it doesn't compress the chest wall when it moves so you see that and you you suddenly recognize it mm -hmm. even though it's been there all along you see so just see something like that and you say well that can't work and then there's also a bit in in that part where the the sacrum hangs in front of the wings of the ilium in the pelvis so the sacrum is actually falling out of the wings of the ilium so there's it's it's hung like a hammock mm -hmm. as opposed to being as the opposed, keystone as opposed to be the keystone Mm -hmm. So I went back to the museum again, and it says it's a five-year period where I'm doing all these things at the same time and doing this bit and that bit. And I looked at all the pelvises there, and they had one that was upside down. Every other one was right. I went up, I went up to uh, uh, to my friend, and I said, "Hey, I think we get, we got one pelvis upside down." We came down, said, <laughs> "Look," and he said, "Oh yeah, we did this wrong." Wait, 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 wait what is that? So, well, one of the creatures had the pelvis where the pelvis was locked in, and every other one, the pelvis, actually, the sacrum actually hangs between the wings of the ilium. Okay, so but I, I thought that they were kind of screwing them together. Well, they were, but I mean, you could see the joint. Ah, okay, so you went to the detail, you were actually looking at them with oh, the... Oh, yeah, with, with looking the... at all these joints and, you know... Okay, so you're not just a passing spectator, no, you, were, right, right, you right. were like an inspector there, you know, we're hey guys, climbing, you know... We're climbing on, uh, you know, on, on these models, we're climbing on top of them here. Yeah. So that was your special pass and special access to the museum that allowed you to get really close. Exactly. See? Okay, and that's also in the back rooms of the of the exposition. In the back rooms, but even but the assembled one were in the front, mm -hmm. and we would actually go down in the display area and climb on these monster things with step ladders and everything. And could the god just go crazy until they saw who it was, and they saw, oh yes, Professor. I <laughs> oh, see. So you, you, okay, you confuse the guard. So yeah, it's like yeah. who are these but, people? But, but you can see the way the joints are, and the, you know, the sacrum falls out of it, and it did it on everyone. And I said there was one model that didn't go that way. I said so we had to go and recheck it, and sure, we, we you know. Well, so in fact, you contributed to the correction of the exposition. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, but this, as I said, all these things. I was going in a lot of different directions at the same time during this five-year period, and one of them was clinical, where I'm actually doing examination of these different joints in the body. Hmm. One of them I did was in those. This was actually before we were doing arthroscopic surgery. But we would, in order to see what was going in, on in the joint to see if it was a meniscal tear, you would inject dye into the into the joint, mm -hmm. and which which outlined the and filled that space and, and outlined the radioactive dye, mm -hmm. you see, a radio uh, uh, opaque dye. So you and outlined the joint. So I actually had my radiologist do standing X-rays of the joint while you know to see if we could see this you know the, the, the space disappear and it didn't disappear now you, we didn't have the MRI where you, you could slice it up very thin so you could we could never prove there wasn't a spot somewhere mm -hmm. in that joint there wasn't but it was clear enough to us you know now that I knew there was a space there mm -hmm. that there was a space there then when I do open surgery I would try and close these spaces. Um, 
and you would meet with significant resistance to closure. We never got it closed. Okay. Okay. And then, then you say, okay, well, let's assess the tissues here. We're talking about that. So you start poking at the tissues, which we already know, and, and you recognize that the articular cartilage, if you did this, would sink, you know, would compress. So, in, in other words, when you would try to, it's actually quite a simple mental math here, right? So, you see, if we talk about this, you know, the original thing that bugged you with the, some particular point on the, on right. the, on top of the, on the femur head. Right. So, a similar experiment, thinking, okay, if we had a 50 kilo or like a 100 pound, uh, well, 150 pounds of weight pressing down, concentrated on a say on a even it was a say a square centimeter the loads would be so significant that the material properties of the cartilage are not capable to withstand it but i think that also it's important to recognize that this is we're talking about the live cartilage right yes oh, so it's we're live. talking about live cartilage not the one which has been boiled in a broth right. you know like no, this is, this is uh, live yeah mm -hmm. you put this on on a hard surface and there's a dent that occurs in the surface that you can't see but it does that mm. we all know that all right you put it on a softer surface and the thing's going to sink down mm. into it and you should be able to see that well, I'm doing arthroscopy. I'm doing these dyes in the joint, and I never see the femur sinking into the tibia. There's always this fine line sitting there. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's easy to say. Well, it doesn't happen because uh, I know the whole body weight is standing on this one square centimeter articular surface in the knee joint, mm. which is the same kind of thing, and it's on a soft jelly-like substance, which is what articular cartilage is like, is like a firm jello, and you're putting it in and it, it's not sinking there because you can see this line just doing this nice So effectively it would be the equivalent of taking, I don't know, a like kitchen table, right, and putting the kitchen table on top of the, like on the surface of a jello, on the surface of the boiled egg. Exactly. So the loads here are more or less the same, say, you know, 50 pound w worth of, of kitchen table put on top of the um, on a jelly and you could be sure that it's just readily going to sink in right and until it finds the hardness of whatever of the glass jar or right. something like this which has a greater which has a high, higher density right so this is so these are the these are the things which really you know bugged you in that sense but well this is this is the first time i could do experimental work trying to com yeah, to directly or indirectly confirm this concept. Mm. You see, because I was getting all this now new information and I said, well, I try these kind of things. So I'm making up all these experiments. Now, in those days, of course, nobody cared about you. You're doing things, you didn't have to go through a committee to get things signed, mm. all sort of things. And what I did was maybe a little shady in, in these days, but, you know, it, it, it never did more than pr you know, prolong an operation, say, for a few more minutes mm -hmm. uh, because I would do a more detailed examination trying to stress the tissues in certain ways. Um, and the same thing with, you know, like the x-rays, usually those were done lying down. Uh, you know, so we say, okay, let's also do your standing up. And you oh, which is not a bad thing to do. Is that right? right. So, so you know, because it's, it's, it's actually closer to the practicality of the knee usage. You Absolutely. Know? So these kind of things were being done all the time. You know. Uh, but we're talking about what? Five cases, ten cases, fifty cases. I did it in every surgical procedure I did. I try to figure out a way of testing these things. You're talking well over a hundred cases so, in, of different parts of the body doing different things at different times. So I do things like uh, ankle surgery. So I'm still doing general orthopedics and I do something like ankle surgery and I look for the space in the joint because you know you're looking for that and I do things like fusions and cut the ligaments and see the, the space close down. So if you cut the ligaments the space closes down. Right. Right, mm. and so I actually designed 
uh, an operation based on that concept because it's like, for instance, very hard to do fusion. It used to be very hard to do a fusion of the talotibial joint. Mm -hmm. and, and the, the procedure for doing a fusion is you decorticate it. You take the cartilage off the two surfaces mm -hmm. and, then and you roughen the bone mm -hmm. and that makes soft cancellous bone because that's what's under the cartilage. It's still very soft, mm -hmm. mushy stuff. And you get those two edges, the surfaces together, and they should fuse in a week or two because it's, you know, viable, low, soft stuff. It's not hard, and it. But they use it. was a very difficult thing to get that to fuse. Well, I had. And what what was happening? So I had to do an ankle fusion. So I decorticated it and I took it down, and I said, okay. I'm going to cut these ligaments on the side, which aren't going to be any use anyway, because the ankle's both going to be fused. So I cut the ligaments on the sides, su supporting the ankle joint, and the ankle joint goes like this, and the bone fuses overnight, practically, because that space just closed down. And of course, when I first did it, you, I did try to comp compress the space, and you couldn't do it. There's always that space there. Until you cut the ligaments. Then but about. eventually, when the bone fusion happens, then it becomes basically a continuous bone, effectively. Right. So, right. with all the properties of, right. the, of the bone, it. in that right. sense. Right. Okay, so that also just shows you very clearly that difference between the like compression transfer through the bone as opposed to the exactly. tension transfer exactly. around it. Right. Mm. But so once again, just to summarize it, I think that this is important to highlight that you were, if we were, you were referring to these books which are highlighting the tensional property of the interosseous membrane and how that passes the forces through. But just to kind of add to this line, so you know, if we look at the dissection, the interosseous membrane is much denser than, uh, for example, the muscles or the ligaments. So which sort of in that respect might say well you know this is a very dense element with a very minimal yield and so it does the tension transfer well so how about the you know ligaments and the muscles which are much uh, you know which, which has a much greater yield ratio so so maybe they are not that suitable for this kind of tension transfer purpose so how did you, you obviously went through a certain spectrum of the tension coefficients to say so, or the elasticity yeah, ratios. Well, I just assumed that all soft tissue was working as a functional unit because in the model is continuous tension, discontinuous compression. It means that all the soft tissue is doing their thing all the time. Now the the story always comes out, well the muscles are are relaxed. Well the muscles as a surgeon, you cut a muscle, even somebody in deep anesthesia, and it pulls apart. You can't put them together. You, know, you, you, you everything has to be in tension. And when you sew on these things, you always have to malposition things to try and get tensional elements to sew together. So mm -hmm. sewing a, you know, repairing a cruciate ligament, for instance, you, you can't just put them together in time. You find the, where they're loose. They're never loose. You have to add tendons and pull them and malposition the thing in such a way, give it a really tugs, all sorts of things, because these tension, these tissues are always under tension. You go back even, you know, and check out uh, electromyographs too, because I did that, because you, you all read all this stuff, and you find out that muscles, you know, you, when you're standing, you are, there's, always muscle tension, mm -hmm. even though the EMG is normal. So the EMG doesn't tell you, and if you read the books, EMG doesn't tell you when a muscle is acting, it only tells you when it's actively contracting. So that, that's very, the, the, the very, you know, like so, the tension range. So, so the EMG is, uh, you know, doesn't tell you, only tells you active contraction. Mm. Doesn't tell you that there's tension in the muscle. So, because, and then you know there's tension all over the place. So, when you're doing the surgery, even when these people are lying on the table, I'm, under anesthesia, you cut it, the damn thing pulls apart. So, in that sense, 
even if I kind of try to be the devil's advocate yeah. there and say, well, you know, interosseous membrane from your textbook is a special, super dense thing. But in reality, what you see there is more the spectrum where it doesn't sort of interosseous membrane doesn't stand out as something super special in that sense. Right. It's just you know part of the whole system. Okay. And that you know if, if you know if you don't have a big heavy thing pulling, you have a bunch lots of little things doing it. So, so that's that's it another was, point. Yes, yeah, it was not it was not a difficult concept for me at all. That part. Once I understood muscles are working that way that it wasn't a problem. Okay, so in that sense the transition to tension so if I just put it in a sort of simpler way or a more compact way so you started like very much everybody else in your profession with what looked as a compression continuum right bone continuously passing the load onto another bone and then you were growing sort of dissatisfied with it whilst trying to apply this not even questioning whether the joint space is closed and so on assuming that it's really bone right. on bone yes and you know you carried this assumption further when you were looking at the giant uh, skeletons but with the giant skeletons you didn't question that element first you started questioning the weak links there so the strange kind of strangely positioned toes and so on right. so this thing so that was that wasn't that was the kind of your grain of doubt or with the continuous compression system right so once you clicked on the idea that it's actually possible to create a volumetric system which would be structurally based on the continuous tension then all then you know the the sub the smaller details with it that wasn't the problem so in that sense it was quite clear to see the spectrum of tension of the elasticity and so yeah on. it no longer became a problem my problem the what i spent the the time doing was trying to disprove the concept of tensegrity i'm always looking to see where it, where that this model failed so I would see if there was a space. I would see, try those kinds of things. So that's a very good point. So at first, you try to basically look in the mirror and say, "Hey, Steve, Stephen, you know, aren't you going crazy? Right. So you know, what kind of strange concepts are you bringing in? So maybe you are actually wrong. You better keep." You, you know, you better keep silent about it until people uh, yeah. start saying that you are a bit off. Well, I would keep bringing in my friends and associates and things to try and show them this thing going on at the, at the operating table. And they would look and say, oh yeah, and walk away. They would see it but not see it. It but didn't shake the foundations it, of their, of their reason, world. No, no. For some strange now, reason, yes. Now, my most famous experiment is, from my standpoint was I had one of the um, orderlies in the hospital was a patient of mine who, and he needed knee surgery. And I said, this is by, by that time I was doing arthroscopic surgery. Orderly? What is that? It was, it was the guy who pushes the carts around and does the, you know. Okay, I see. And, so yeah. assistant to whatever. Right, order, right. Okay. Yeah, mostly, you know, he moves carts around and he keeps things in order, things like that. So, but he was a patient of mine. And I, I said, he wanted, he needed knee surgery. I said, look. I'll do knee surgery, but I want to do it on the local, and I want to put you on this tilt table, and stand you up and see what it's like. And this, by this time, I was doing knee surgery. But, uh, okay, so tilt. Office. Let's visualize it. The tilt table. How did it look like? All right. The tilt table is a, a table where you just it's used uh, in rehabilitation mostly to get people who are lying down to stand up straight. Mm -hmm. So you can go from horizontal to full vertical on mm -hmm. it. And you just strap these people on the table. So okay, so first off. you put him, you know, horizontally, horizontal. and then you did the you did the tilt. Yeah. So you tilted him to the near vertical or to the full vertical? Full vertical. Full vertical. Vertic full vertical. And I'm at, at that point. I'm sitting on the floor with an arthroscope in his knee, looking at his knee joint, and looking for that space. 
to close. To close, and of course it didn't close. Okay, but so let's again let's let's kind of put a like a grain of doubt. But was he tightly strapped? All right. The grain the of doubt is there because with the scope you can't see all the space at the same time. Mm -hmm. You can only see you know parts of it. So he was actually getting at least you know like half of his weight and load, or oh yeah, easily, cool. easily. So, yeah. which we talk about, you know, like easily 100 plus pounds. Oh, yes. Okay. Oh, yeah. so, There's a big guy doing, you know, he's an oily. That's his job is to push things around. Okay, so in that sense, we talk about the fact that this quite significant loads didn't produce it. So, and right, in fact, right. but even if, the, even, even if we continue this, so even if getting local and not seeing everything at the same time, still that would mean that the loads would be actually concentrated on a on a like a quarter right. like uh, right. space and even that if it sunk in which it would have to be on this soft cartilage that you know, the dam uh, should be visible yeah that should be that sinking in should be visible mm -hmm. it's not okay and of course at that time he started vomiting and vomited on my head but that's another <laughs> story <laughs> <laughs> because he was awakened under local anesthesia. But this, but as I said, that was the closest I got to really having somebody absolutely weight bearing and looking at knee joint um, with it. But as I said, I looked at so many other tissues and so many other joints. I, you know, I did wrists, I did elbows, I did shoulders, you know, I did, I looked at all these things, ankles. I looked at all these things and I made it my point even sometimes I go into friend surgery because I would, didn't do that particular case and I wanted to test a particular joint and I would go in and watch them and then say okay let's try get this together and let's see if we can close this point and I could never get a joint with intact ligaments around it to close down. So you know the space is always there which is you know, to me that's insanity, but the only model I've got to get explained is, is this one. You know, so, so this model became it for me. And then I started formulating concepts built around this model. That's, you know, so that's expanded since then. So in that sense, now we're talking about the fact that you started with the spinal model. Yeah. So with the spinal realization for yourself, but then that kind of expanded into other joints and interactions. Well, I knew that if it worked in the spine, it had to work every place else. That was very quickly recognized that it was a total body concept. Because again, I was back down to the embryology, seeing this thing build up, and I knew that at each stage of that construction, it had to work as a stable structure. So you couldn't, you know, halfway, it always had to be that. So I knew right from that the whole body was going to be working. Okay, so in that sense, I think that that's also an important thing that highlights, right? Because technically speaking, there is no motion as such in utero, right? But there is a mechanical, the, the continuity of the mechanical homeo homeostasis. So that is, I think, is, a, is also a very important shift of the perspective that you start your way from the mechanical build and mechanical homeostasis and eventually it kind of comes to the stage when it's movable when there is you know when you st can think of motion so motion itself appears much later okay all embryologic development in every creature starts in a closed pack omnidirectional pressure environment in water in, in utero you're always being pushed from all sides at the same time. Mm -hmm. So you have to resist that being pushed in in all directions by pushing out in all directions. So that means you have to have this omnidirectional construction that's all, that'll take stresses in all directions, pushing you in and squishing you. We know that bone and muscle and tensional tissues, whatever you want to call is a relationship of development of the stresses of the structure, uh, stresses creating those structures, including in utero. So your skeleton is developed in utero, which means that 
and you're resisting this compression force by pushing out against it. So your skeleton is a product of an omnidirectional force squishing you, you know, from all directions, trying to squash you, and you're resisting it. And that has to come from in you. So it's whatever you built in the utero. The thing about this structure is that once you take it out of that environment, it still works. Hmm. Right. That's exactly the point. That's so that it's, it's, so, right. it's, so that's that's the essential thing which you where you, we talk about the transition from the non from the yields to motions. Right. Effectively, in utero, we the maximum range we're talking about we're talking about the yields, right? right? So we're not we're not talking about the motion per se. Right. So the motion per se appears only once you are out. Right. But that close packing is what develops it and that's when you talk about the close packing of foams and bubbles and things is the same as the close packing of the organism which is a collection of foams and bubbles and some of it gets harder because of the stresses of compression and some of it gets more elastic because there's more tension on it because that's the miracle of life is what happens okay fantastic huh. All right. Such amazing stuff. <laughs> um, and that's it. Four, five, and six. That was great. <laughs> yeah, we invite you to turn cameras on and um, you can do a raise hands thing if you um, if you have a comment or question. Or just jump in. Seeing people that we haven't seen in a while, meeting new people like Jody, Olga, it's great to see you. Kayla, great to see you. Okay, Maureen, go ahead. Yes, I like to say that it was really great to hear the whole story about the joint spaces. Um, and I really enjoyed it, and I think I haven't heard it yet uh, like that. Thank you, Steve. Well, actually, nobody heard it before, so to tell <laughs> you the truth. Because, you know, look, it's, it's really one of those things, is that if you think about some of the bigger things, which we kind of grew to get uh, accustomed, right? So you see, when they got into the flow and into the way, for example, Sigmund Freud, right? The entire psychoanalysis, you know, what is it? To begin with, it was hardly, I don't remember, but five cases, 10 cases, each of them actually, you know, like really explained. The whole gender theory and this John Money, it was like started with one case, you know, with the twins. You know, like it's just, and I was really impressed because I before that, for years, I've heard about this orderly and their you know, and that surgery that was done on him. But I didn't realize that there were like at least a hundred of those surgeries. I didn't yeah. realize that and Steve didn't really announce it. And then, mm -hmm. you know, that's why I think it's it's kind of, you know, it's, it's I'm still struggling to understand, right? So you see where the world is missing it, but, um, you know, we and I think that in that, you know, like latest foray into the story of anatomy that we've done with Graham lately, so it's kind of becoming more understandable. But um, that's it. It's just the number of the demonstrations there has been very, very remarkable, and it's also very special to see that, you know, it's the seventies where that was Steve mentioned. So there was much more freedoms in terms of doing this kind of experiments and so on, because now, obviously, for every single person, he would have needed, uh, you know, a special 
permission of the ethics committee and that and that and that and that and that and the whole like uh, and uh, yeah and those days it was just uh, natural so i think that that that's also an an, an important thing that yeah it, to tell you the truth i've i didn't know about the number the number of cases before so that was something that kind of just emerged through the conversation Everyone's dumbstruck. No, I mean, uh, <laughs> hi, Maggie. <laughs> Maggie's laughing. <laughs> Let me just share my screen for a minute. I want to show something. Oh, great. All right. Can you see this? Yes. All right. This is a stress strain curve of bone, tendon, and cartilage. And you can see how soft cartilage is as compared to bone. And that cartilage is, is just mush. There's no way it could sustain any load. I mean, and it, there's some grass that even show it even more uh, differently than that. But uh, so is, why are these linear? They look quite linear rather than. Yeah, well, it's just the way they made the graph. That's all. It's okay. So you didn't create stress. this. Yeah, you this, this is somebody. Yeah, okay, see, great. this is a stress of bone. That's yeah. very elastic and it goes up like this. And this yeah. is a tendon that's less elastic, but still relatively stiff at times. And this is cartilage, which is just mush. <laughs> so that you start here and it just, it would just squish down. So these are relative, these aren't, you know, exactly the scale, but gives you an idea of the relative stiffness and elasticity of the different materials. This is measured in vivo? Uh, I don't know. Okay. But it doesn't matter. You know, you see, the right. thing that we see here is the difference, right? So right. you see that there is a dramatic, and from that perspective, of course, if you start digging further, you know, like linearity, non-linearity, but this is what we can extract. You see, you have the, the spectrum and the different parts of the spectrum. So where cartilage as a load transfer doesn't really hold much yeah, respect, sure. if you put it this way. As I said, so there's no sense in loading cartilage. It, it doesn't hold up anything. It just would squish. Like, it's, you know, it's like a soft rubber. Or as I said, as I always compare it to, is uh, the, like the weight of a hard boiled egg. Because not only is it soft, but it also shears very easily and breaks. Just collapses down. All right. Let's see. Stop share. All right. Well, you know, maybe I'll. I, I still want to sort of maybe highlight a, a couple of points. Right? Is that? Uh, you know, also, Myron, speaking of the tilt table, right? So you see, that was also, I've heard about the tilt table a hundred times before, but I didn't really get the full image, right? So you see, that's what I was trying to extract, right? So just to, to convey the real atmosphere, not just, okay, so we put the someone who is called the orderly, right? And of course, you know, with American language, a lot of things kind of are different which you don't understand. What is the mall? You know, a shopping mall, right? So you see what, you know, Washington mall, what is that? You know, like the, 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 and yet another giant mall in, in, you know, in North America. So you have to sort of, oh, by the way, then the mall is a park, right? So you see then the same thing, the orderly is the assistant who is pushing carts. You know, it's just, you know, you, you're trying to get this atmospheric thing and trying to say kind of, you're trying to visualize how the whole thing was and you know you have the opportunity to dig in and really say okay the tilt table how does that work so was it vertical or was it not or maybe the person was strapped so tight that he was actually just like literally you know just flying right 
just being suspended in there. So this is these are the things that you want to figure out and sort of to understand and, and kind of dig into to visualize the whole thing. Yeah, and it's great, Lena, the number of times <laughs> Steve was ready to go on and you're like, whoa, 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 wait, 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 slow down, slow down. <laughs> Let's go into this point. Because part of what I get out of this is just, and what I have gotten out of working with Steve is it's helped improve my critical thinking skills. You know, my ability to, to think a little more deeply and to think in a new way about things. Oh, raised hand. Diane, you've got a question, go ahead or comment. Unmute. Yes, my question is, we hear from clients, um, uh, been to my orthopedic uh, guy, and he says that it's my knees are knee is bone on bone, and it has to be replaced, and uh, doesn't really explain uh, bone on bone, we know that it's not bone on bone, what do you say to these clients? What does do we say? to help them understand what's actually going on in the joint. Well, it, at that point, it may actually be bone on bone. And that was, that's the problem. Normally there is a space there. And if for some reason, usually a soft tissue weakening of the tension system, then it does get bone on bone. And he's just saying, that what he considers as normal, bone on bone, is pathological. So he okay. recognizes that bone on bone is a pathological situation. You can't really load a joint that way. Right, right, understandably, right? okay. So if if it is bone on bone, it's too late. You gotta, you know, you can't fix right. it. So you in know, other words, there is some truth to that statement. Yes, but he's at the same time it's a recognition by the person, the surgeon, that bone that are you know you can't really load bone on bone in a joint, you get into trouble. Yes, that's what we've heard. We hear. Right. Thank you. But then, of course, you know, this, the, the opposite is, is also the case, right? So you see, like, if you listen through the entire interview, what is the key statement when the ligaments and the other soft tissues around the bone, are around the joint are intact and in good tensional shape, so that, that conflict of bone on bone doesn't happen. So therefore, in that sense, if you talk about from the perspective of a client who comes to you and seeks your help, so then the message there would be is that actually, you know, like where would be your presence in this situation, right? So your presence in this situation would be in trying to improve as much as possible, the, not trying to physically sort of separate and move the bones one away from each other, right? So you see, or do some other stuff. But we you know your presence would be in, in reaching that kind of tensional distribution and the surrounding around the joints. So that would be the, the whole essence of your, you know, of your help. It is my feeling that if prolotherapy is working, what prolotherapy is doing is tightening the ligaments or soft tissues around the joint to pull that joint open. So that no matter again what they say they're doing, I'm not sure. But what's actually may be happening is that uh, the prolotherapy is a, a tight stiffens those ligaments and structures around the joint, and therefore puts more tension in the system. Yeah, but Diane is talking from the perspective of the movement therapist, right? Mm -hmm. Right, but I'm just saying, you know, there's. The people who are dealing with some of these things uh, often give the do the right thing for the wrong reasons. <laughs> so that prolotherapy may be doing something, you know, we have people who do prolotherapy and get great results with the bread. Uh, Fullerton, for instance, does a lot of prolotherapy stuff, 
but and gets good results. But I think it's it's a different reason that he actually thinks it is. Oh, well then, good. <laughs> we have a uh, question from Monica on YouTube. Um, I think based on that chart you showed, Steve, uh, each material has its molecular structure and its organization in biotensegrity. Is that it? I, I'm going to. It seems like it's not in biotensegrity that yeah, right. different materials have their different structures that as we as we grow as embryologically, there are different densifications and structural arrangements within the system, but better to put it over to you, Steve. Yeah, but we, not only that, but the, you have to recognize that we're dealing with condensed soft matter, which is essentially silly putty kind of things. And what is soft becomes hard and what hard becomes soft, depending on how it's loaded or the rate it's loaded or a variety of different things. So we can't really know what's hard all the time we can't always know what's soft all the time because it's an instantaneous thing that may change so when you are running that oscalsis and and the fat on the uh, on the foot might get really stiff and hard and springy uh, but the next second when you poke at it it may feel soft and you think it's soft well it's not soft it's hard at the instant it's being loaded and I have another graph that uh, I could show you that shows you that bone under different rates of loading have different stiffnesses. And this is true with all stiff, uh, all biologic tissue. So you can't always tell what is hard and what is soft. And that's something I didn't know when I first started, but has come as I've studied more about these things. And this is like so, soft matter. This is like the cornstarch and water, the oobleck, which is, which is, creamy soupy milky but when you punch it it jackets and it's very hard and stiff and as soon as you but you if you don't punch it quick and hard it won't if you're hesitant you'll splash um I think yeah that's that was, that's exactly the, that's exactly technically speaking the instantaneous rate of loading right so yeah. and i mean this is also something that i believe we need to address because you know what we have and maybe graham can you extract that you know that uh like read the the super ridiculous quote from uh, that article on on mole you know that molecules collect into whatever into cells cells into bodies and so on do, do you have it on nearby so you see that we can just read this you know as a like as a human to ridiculousness but me meanwhile a uh, give me a few minutes and have a look all right but, yeah. but but hold on but uh, what, what i was trying to say is that you see it's in fact it's the same thing trying to do things from the ground up with molecules it's you know with the molecular structure is the same problem as with the anatomy so they try to, you know, they first, in a certain, you know, it's generalizing the particular situation, right? Because when we say it's dead, you know, dead is not just a kind of statement, well, dead or alive. It's a statement that when it's dead, that whole spread of ranges of the responses, which it has as a soft matter, collapses and becomes very narrow. So yeah. therefore, what they do, they first study anatomy on the dead one, where it has a much narrower range of responses, and then try to rebuild the live thing with much greater range of responses out of those dead ones, and then demand that it has to be exactly the same shape, it has to be exactly the same, you know, attachments it has to be exactly the same everything and it has to follow you know the exact you know differential equations of the second order right so it's the same thing what is a molecular structure molecular structure is a snapshot of averages that occur at a particular time so it doesn't rise up from molecules it forms 
you know, it kind of it evolves with the uninterrupted history from, you know, zygote to the multicellular organism, right? So, therefore, this kind of problem of machine and assembly thinking as if we can assemble it. No, we cannot. <laughs> this thing has not been assembled. Machines are assembled. This thing grew. It wasn't assembled. And on the practical side, it means that it has a much wider range of those kind of flips of status. This is kind of getting back to the example of the cornstarch. You, if you only measure the response of the cornstarch on the slow loading, then you would be absolutely convinced to the very, you know, and they could put you on a lie detector, they could put your hand on Bible, they could put, you know, let's say they could torture you, right? So you see, but you would still say cornstarch is soft, you know, and, you know, you will kind of go on, you know, out of the fair for that. So, but then suddenly somebody makes a quick load and that same cornstarch instantaneously at that transient, transient loading is hard. So, yeah. and then this is exactly the point when, oh, by the way, now we have to flip our whole thing from the permanent structures to those transiences which can stack and which can do this and this and this and this and that's a whole different that's a whole different uh, you know way of, of of looking at things and and I, I i keep getting back to it and this is was the subject of our kind of recent conversations with graham is that you know we really have to understand that how badly we are affected by anatomy you know, like how much our mm -hmm. perception of everything, right? So you see that anatomy preceded the, you know, the anatomical thing preceded the emergence of everything that we know. So therefore we take anatomy, which is a map with all the distortions and lies and so on and kind of, you know, biases that the map has, we confuse it with the reality. And we then try to reconstruct reality as if the map was a reality. So, and this just has been there for so long. And this is why, you know, what you see is that people, you see this phenomenon over and over again. People who are incredibly smart and who can, who know, you know, like a lot and who can called long logical chains and complexities and so on, when it comes to medical questions, they instantly, instantaneously become dumb. <laughs> like, okay, this well, is well, a paradox, well, you know? Smartest people, by the time they approach humans, live humans, they instantaneously become dumb. And you're just like, what <laughs> happened to you? You were so smart, you know, before, and now suddenly... And this is this is the problem of anatomy, because, you know, well, there is this barrier. There is this barrier that in order to be allowed to think about living matter, you have to be kind of, you know, you have to get through the rites of passage so that you know anatomy enough and that you are allowed to sort of use the anatomical specimens which are being which been prepared for you so that is really the most difficult part and then you know hopefully Graham will find that that quote which is you know absolutely amazing in its ridiculousness okay before we go to that joe has been uh waiting to uh weigh in on i think on the bone on bone thing joe where are you hey hey, joe. hey, hey I, yeah um so um yeah, uh, a couple comments. I don't really have a problem with the, you know, with the bone on bone. It's just that um, I have a problem with the uh, with physicians telling the patient that because um, it, it kind of like uh, gives the impression that there's once that happens, that there's no hope. So a little about my own situation. I just had a, uh, a hip replacement and uh, it was interesting, you know, at how it happened. It, last June, I was 
I was running in a 5K and I felt like, like what I thought was a cramp in my left hip. And I went to see my orthopedist. I, I thought he was just going to say tendonitis and I get a cortisone shot. Uh, but he said, well, he goes, not, he says, well, the cartilage has been gone for years. He says, and you have osteophytes. He says, that's what's so painful. Um, but he also said that he said nearly 100% of the time with hip replacements, they're due to not what they call wear and tear, uh, but through some type of, uh, uh, of congenital deformity. Um, uh, in my case, it was a cam deformity, uh, which is, um, in other words, the, um, the head of my femur, instead of being a nice smooth ball, uh, was shaped like um, a pistol handle. So it's it's kind of like it's in other words, what I'm trying to say is there was something that was kind of uh, maybe overloading the tensegrity system. Um, but still, think about it a minute. Uh, I, I made it to 63 years old before this before this happened. Um, and um, uh, so really, you know, I, again, I don't have a problem with bone on bone. But when you say wear and tear, yeah, it's I I, I don't think that's a good explanation of how if our arthritis happens. Uh, um, and, and I think it, you know, now the, now that the more of the research is coming in, besides these congenital deformities, they're finding that it's uh, issues with, um, with diet and inflammation, with chronic inflammation, um, uh, you know, obesity and metabolic syndrome, and those type of issues that, that, a, um, that affect the cartilage. Uh, previous injury, especially in the knee with the uh, ACL tears, uh, again, where that tensegrity system is disrupted is a cause. But but even that being said, I think, you know, what I've learned from biotensegrity, it teaches us that uh, that when these things happen, uh, it's not the end of the world. Uh, there are answers. But those, to get those answers, I think we have to think more globally. When I go to my physical therapist, the physical therapist is always using terms like Oh, engage the quads, engage the glutes, but um, but I think when you kind of break down the um, uh, the body into to parts like that, I think you're missing the whole uh, you know the whole picture. That stability, that biotensegrity has to has to be uh, has to be global. So yeah, of course I'm doing what the um, yeah, the PT is asking me to do uh, because that's what the, my orthopedist is going to be asking for. But I also um, uh, a lot of my rehab I'm doing on my own is more global, you know, is more, you know, full body is more full body centric. And maybe that's a, uh, a good topic for a, uh, for a future, uh, 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 for a future uh, zoom uh, again, cause I'm not really good on the, with what we're talking about today, which is kind of like the, the theoretical background of biotensegrity. Uh, but I feel that I am pretty good on the, the application side and, you know, that's where I am right now, looking to kind of, uh, you know, to kind of restore that, that biotensegrity uh, back into the, uh, uh, the hip joint. Um, because like I said, I'm 63 and it's worked at all my other joints. And uh, there's, um, uh, and uh, I'm sure there's no, um, there's no reason why it, it wouldn't work on my hip. So, um, so thanks. Thanks, Joe. Great to see you. I um, want to jump in here. Yeah, you're gonna. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna say. Um, so Joe's in Elizabeth, New Jersey, and he's in charge of, or he was anyway. I think he still is of um, physical education for that city, um, the largest Elizabeth in the world, as they say. <laughs> um, and and of course, wear and tear is a machine model, right? I mean, right. that's a machine model thinking. Yeah. Go ahead, uh, Stephen Schafferman. Yes, wear and tear is machine model thinking. It's cadaver thinking. And the whole idea of congenital is absurd. And congenital literally means it came with the genes. Well, how did he get to the age of 63 if there was a genetic problem? And congenital is one of those words that doctors make up as an excuse for the fact that they don't understand biotensegrity and that they don't understand living tissues and systems. And it's decades of very subtle imbalances leading to irritation and osteocytes and wear and tear and tissue breakdown and such, but it's all functional. Everything is functional. Well, the only comparable word is cryptogenic, right? <laughs> 
So, you know, I, I mean, these are my two favorites ones, the idiopathic and cryptogenic, right? So you see, basically, you're just using the Greek and the Latin version for the unknown, and it sounds very clever, right? So that's yes, just... Uh, and that's one of the things that conventional doctors operating the old paradigm are very good at, is applying Latin and Greek labels to excuse their ignorance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it gets back to our friend Thomas Kuhn and the whole idea of paradigm shifts. Yeah. Uh, people are stuck in their models and will rationalize them in all sorts of ways uh, to avoid seeing what's right in front of their faces, living beings. Thank you. Did you find the poem, Graham, or the statement? No, it wasn't the poem. It just uh, it let, let me just let me just show you again. My, I'm going to share screen again and show you bone. Please. All right, this is bone under different strain different strain rates, showing how it goes mm -hmm. from pretty soft, very hard and springy, depending on how, how you load it. You know, this is just a curve of bone under different loading rates. So, I mean, and you have to assume that all tissues do similar things, which they do. And you have to assume that those different loading rates kick in at the appropriate moment. That yeah, it's right. like an I mean, evolutionary strategy for success. Yeah, you, you can't test for what happened 15 seconds ago because 15 seconds ago was different. You see, so you know, so just because they test the bone and it shows you this doesn't mean a thing because it was 15 seconds ago was something else. <laughs> yeah. And I agree with Stephen on this that. You know, that we as physicians make up things that we don't know. You know, the patients want answers and we make up answers that seem to fit, but it's not because we know anything. Craig, you Craig, you're, unmute. you're muted, Craig. Yeah, you're still muted. Let's see. Uh, no, now you're not. Try again, Craig. Something's going on with your audio. Check your mic, Craig. You might be on a different mic than what you think. <laughs> and you can always pop what you want to say into the chat and we can read it if we can't figure out how to get your sound. Sorry. Craig's in South Africa. Where it's for the winter. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so we'll wait until he gets back, right? So yeah. uh, my question to Joe is, what did his hip x-ray look like the day, the week, and the month before he started hurting? I will tell you that the x-ray looked exactly the same. And, you know, there's no way you could tell the difference. So how you can't look at an x-ray and tell somebody is hurting and not hurting by the x-ray nor look at an MRI and tell if somebody's hurting by the MRI or any of those studies, the anatomy and the physiology don't always match. And uh, the almost related, right? Craig's comment is that he saw a cricket player struck by a hard ball, his arm bent 90 degrees without any other effects afterwards. So it did that without breaking, it just, and I remember Steve taking my forearm years ago and saying, your bones are bendable. And he 
<laughs> he bent my arm. It's wild. Well, you should have filmed that. <laughs> I didn't know it was going to happen until he had done it. <laughs> I got a question. So, Steve, you were you were saying uh, when you were doing back surgery, for instance, that it, you didn't have a sense of how it was actually working, but it was it was effective. I was wondering, I, I, do you feel like now you have a much better sense of why those surgeries were effective as, as well as why the manual uh, interventions were effective? Uh, yeah, well, there's some things that you know, like you can do with a herniated disc that's pressing on a nerve. There's no question you can take off that, take that pressure out when you remove the disc, uh, pressing on it, and you, it's a, you know, it's clear. The interesting thing is that almost all herniated discs will get better on their own, even with nerve, everything going on. And the only indication in my mind now for a back surgery for a herniated disc is with bowel or bladder dysfunction. We're, we're caught at Quantum syndrome. You got to treat them right away. Other than that, you can wait as long as you want and they get all get better. The disc surgery, for instance, wasn't first developed until the mid 1930s and moved along into the 40s. And that's when they first started doing it. There were not hundreds of thousands of people lying around waiting to get their disc surgery over the years. Most of those people who had the back problems got better and went on to normal lives during the time. And in certainly in uh, countries where they don't have a surgeon standing by waiting to cut them, you know, yes, they're out of action with their back pain for a while and then they go back to work. So it's, it's a, almost all back pain is uh, resolves on its own. You just have to accept it and know it. That's going to happen. In you know, in modern medicine, we tend to be more aggressive and do these terrible things to people. But yeah, uh, but um, yes, if the problem was a joint phenomena where the joint was being painful, and somehow I kept that joint from moving, then I eliminated the pain. If on the other hand, I could restore the most, the normal motion in the joint, I also would have uh, 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 handled the pain. So yes, I could, when doing spinal surgery and fusing a back, and the problem is coming from a joint, and you remove that motion in the joint, not only do you remove the motion, but you denervate the joint as part of the surgical procedure, so the pain it goes away on those things. One day I stopped and said, what do you do when you do back surgery? Well, the first thing you do when you do back surgery is you the patient is lying on a gurney and you're going to put them on a back frame to operate on, which is a sort of a bridge arch kind of thing that so you lie them on their belly on this arch frame. All right. So you put them under anesthesia and you roll them over onto this frame. Well, that's manipulation of the spine under anesthesia. Then you make an incision in the spine, and even though, even with now, when you do little with little instruments now, and I'm a big fancy, but there's no way of getting down to that nerve area around the joint without denervating the joint, which is what you do. Then you go in there, you may take out the disc or whatever you want to do, and then you close up the thing, and the last thing you do is another manipulation under anesthesia. Now, the question is, could you stop that at any long way along the line and get the same results? So there used to be surgical procedures where you did a manipulation under anesthesia and that was it. And often you would get people better by just doing that. So the problem is that in surgery, they focus on a particular aspect of the surgery but often ignore the many steps in that surgery that also may have had effect. And I'm as guilty of that as any other surgeon. All right. So, and Doug, what's your 
impression. Well, this uh, this gets rather personal related to my back as well. So we'll, we'll, we can discuss that part later. <laughs> I see, I see, I see. Okay, so it's... it is uh, both both interesting, hypothetical, and personal all at the same time. Right. Uh, yeah, and we know that that there are people walking around with horrible looking X-rays. Uh, Landon, you've done some really good presentations in tea parties on this. You know, where if you looked at the x-ray, you'd say, wait, this person can't walk. And yet they do. Yeah, that's the case. Absolutely. So, but, you know, that's probably indeed, that's a subject for another conversation, right? So you see, because, yeah. you know, that really brings us to these other things about the, you know, where we discuss the behavior on top of the structure, right? So you see, this is really the essential, essential thing. So which it's not easy to kind of get, get used to it, right? So you see, we're all very much conditioned uh, into, yes. into that. And into the into anatomical the... pieces. I, I was looking into this concept of origin and insertion point. I mean that that goes back at least to Vesalius, and it's it's another machine model. You don't take a muscle and then insert it onto you know <laughs> onto the bone. It doesn't work that way. There's no concept of embryological development continuum when you when you talk about an origin and an insertion. Well, I found the 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 quote that I was looking for. Okay. So I I'll put it here and then we'll read it. It's just it's remarkable in its ridiculousness. Um, Please. But at the same time, it's also very informative because of that, right? So I press it here, right, and then read it. So you see, in the 20th century, biomedical sciences became divided into specific domains such as cell biology and molecular biology. These reductive techniques were exceptionally powerful in some ways over efforts of the prior generations. What might have been called tissue biology fell from primacy, often dismissed by funding bodies and editorial commentators as merely descriptive. But... You know, now, so far, it sounds great, right? Like, recognizing the reductionists and so on. And then, mm -hmm. a flip. Science in the 21st century, however, now re teach, reaches to systems biology, recognizing that molecules assemble into cells and cells assemble into tissues and tissues into bodies and bodies into ecosystems and has fostered the mathematical tools for describing and modeling biological systems to more fully reveal that the whole is more than the sum of parts. See, like, you got the first statement, you got the third statement, first statement, wow, yes, indeed, we have to be again, you know, like, finally, we, we're leaving the reductionism, right? Statement number three, there are mathematical tools and so on. And then a statement number two, Molecules assembling into cells. Who the fuck has ever seen that? Molecules assembling into cells, you know? Cells assembling into tissues mm -hmm. and tissues into bodies. And then, but like, you see, this is an example of the well meaning people who were brought up in their whole thing you know they for them in this whatever from anatomy to molecular biology so they believe in this and you know that is really a great illustration what kind of you know how deep is this contamination and the, these the are first, the same people these are the same step. people huh that first step molecules assemble into cells as if that could happen, as if I could take a dish and if I just put the right molecules in, I will get life. Well, that's it. 
So you see, you you deserve, you know, not the Nobel Prize, but you know, you'll be immortalized in, you know, in <laughs> epics of the entire mankind, you know, let's say, and uh, you know, Tibetan monks are going to sort of sing your name every single day, right? So you see, because you have recreated life, you know. So and then cells into tissues and so on and so on. So this and these are the same people. This is an article. Yeah, where is from, this from? You need to give us the uh, citation. It's an article from Steco and Neil Tease. These yeah. are the same people who have troubles understanding biot integrity. For them, biot integrity is a high-level conceptual model, which is not very well connected to the reality. They can't understand the architectural principles of Van der Waal. They can't do, but that's what they bring. And this gets published. Okay. Like I would invite them, either one of them or both of them, if they ever see or hear this discussion, I would just like to say that what we're doing here is open inquiry, right? We come together as equals and we discuss. So since you're bringing up their work, I would say that this is an invitation to them. Of course, you know, let's say, but, you know, and we will, we are able to, you know, we'll be happy to even over, you know, put aside the, the statement that molecules assemble into cells. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, right. So that uh, something that has, no one has ever seen ever. And, and then, the, okay, so then let's say, let's say that's not even there. Take that away. Just take go to it the next away, one. and we will take away so that the even... next one cells assemble into tissues. Well, one cell divide or multiply, depending on how you want to look at it, and then as that happens from embryo through embryological development. No, no, no. The embryological development is not the keys here. In an embryological okay. case, in the scenario, you have the organism first, right? So you see this exactly. statement. This statement might come from the tissue engineering, you know, that you sort of, you know, that you plant a cell and then you create and so on and you can recreate the tissue this way. This kind of, kind of can somewhere, you know, can go some, somewhere. But on the other hand, of course, you know, the whole set of constraints that you create in order to make this happen is absolutely like, you know, there is a machine the machine of a laboratory which sits behind it somehow gets can and creates those very narrow conditions somehow this gets completely discounted as if it's like something very minor so you know but this is a great example of well meaning people who are positioning themselves as anti reductionists and who are positioning themselves as pro-system sciences and so on. And then what do we have? You know, statement one, statements three, but then there is a bombshell in between, right? So this is unfortunately the reality of what we are dealing with, right? So you see like how contaminated is the field of thinking and um, this i believe is what we need to raise the toast right so you see for the people who are able to write to get the inquisitive questions of the right kind even at the difficult scenarios right so you see therefore before the internet before their ability to share and actually kind of asking the right kind of questions and realizing the right kind of discoveries. How come that this thing shows the tension and compression continuity in any position throughout? So that's what I would make my personal toast here. So I guess we are in the... Are we three. doing a closing toast? Yes, <laughs> I'm, closing I'm doing because, you know, like it's three hours that you've yeah, been yeah, around. No, I right? know. I'm, I'm there. Okay. Mm. 
But I want to reiterate before we go off YouTube and off our recording that these debates and these arguments are not fights. They are the kind of open scholarly debate that moves all science forward. And we are more than happy to have these open discussions and invite um, the authors, uh, Carla Stecco, Neil Dees, to invite them to discuss their concept. Yeah, and their perspectives. We're not, we're not just shutting people down. We're saying, we don't see it. Let's talk. Because when we have opposite perspectives and a willingness to engage in that conversation, we can get somewhere. Hopefully. So, but unfortunately, you know, we have to go very far back, right? So you see, and this is really, that's not easy. Okay, so, but with this, thank you, everybody. And thank you, Steve, you know, for being you and <laughs> for getting this thing alive. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for listening. I don't know what this is all about. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just.